Gabrielle Bhutan on behalf of the State of California. Good morning. Good morning, Matthew Wise on behalf of the State of California. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Emil Petrosian from the Manat Firm on behalf of the City of San Jose and Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Sue Ann Evans for proposed plaintiff and intervention, Los Angeles Unified School District. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Ezra Rosenberg from the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law for the City of San Jose and the Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Good morning. Good morning. Ana Cordado from the Nat Firm for City of San Jose and Black Alliance for Just Immigration. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Malia McPherson for the City of Oakland. Good morning. Your Honor, Harvey Levine, City Attorney of Fremont. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Charles Coleman, Holland and Knight for the County of Los Angeles Plaintiff. Good morning, Your Honor. David Holtzman from Holland Knight on behalf of the County of Los Angeles. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Kate Bailey from the Department of Justice on behalf of defendants. And I'm joined this morning by my colleague, Andrew Z, also from the Department of Justice. Good morning. Um, we are here on uh, the defendant's motions to dismiss in these two related cases. Um, let me just make a few preliminary comments about uh, where this stands from my perspective. Um, I have reviewed the briefing that uh, has been submitted on the matter and various amicus briefs. Uh, I read with interest uh, Judge Furman's um, very scholarly recent decision in the uh, related um, matter that's before him. Um, I don't have a formal tentative ruling. I want to hear from all of you instead. Uh, but I will say that having um, spent some time with what you've submitted to me, just my impression at this stage, to guide you a bit perhaps, is um, I, I do think it's rather clear that the APA claims for relief are likely to go forward. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced uh, by the defendant's arguments regarding standing or political question precluding such claims. Um, I will hear argument and we'll see, but to give you a sense of where I th see things, I, I um, am at that point, um, having again reviewed what you've submitted. Uh, the enumeration clause claim uh, claims, um, I'm not, uh, I, I don't have a tentative view. I know uh, I have the benefit of Judge Furman's analysis and then have read what the uh, parties have submitted, so I'll, we'll hear argument and see where, where that goes. Um, after arguments on the merits, we can discuss the way forward um, in the event that I do find that uh, the matter is going to proceed. We can talk about um, what that means in terms of scheduling. I appreciate very much I received the joint report on each of the cases, uh, uh, giving me some guidance on where the parties see this uh, uh, in the event we are proceeding forward and so we can discuss the scheduling and, and some discovery issues once we get through the merits discussion. So uh, with that, why don't I begin with the moving party with the government and you can um, approach it in any order you would like. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. In March 2018, Commerce Secretary Ross exercised his virtually unlimited discretion to reinstate a question with a nearly 200-year pedigree to gather demographic information on the U.S. population. That decision fully comports with the congressional delegation of authority to the Secretary to conduct the census in such form and content as he may determine. Plaintiffs claim that it is- Any limits at all on the Secretary's discretion in conducting the census, any at all? Certainly, Your Honor. There have been numerous cases that have challenged the calculation methodology that the Secretary employs to count the population. Those cases are fully justiciable because they, uh, they implicate the constitutional command to conduct an actual enumeration, which means a person-by-person -person headcount. And so the Supreme Court decisions and decisions of lower courts that have looked at different procedures that were put in place to effectuate that constitutional command are surely justiciable. 
at the plaintiff's position, and again, we're on a motion to dismiss here, that that's precisely what his conduct is doing. It's implicating the enumeration process. It's chilling the enumeration process. So isn't that more or less exactly what was justiciable in the cases that you just made reference to? No, Your Honor, because plaintiff's claim here doesn't implicate whether or not the Secretary is actually putting in place procedures to count each and every member of the U.S. population. And there, there's no allegation that he has not done so. That's what's been at issue in earlier cases. There's never before been a case that challenged the content of the questionnaire or looked at another way. Isn't there a position that the inclusion of the citizenship, citizenship question has the effect of reducing the count? Because but, it's chilling in, in, their, in their view. And doesn't that, in, under anyone's theory, isn't that a claim that the actual counting will be impacted? Their claimed injury is that the count will be lower, but that doesn't mean that they've met their threshold burden to establish um, that they have plausible allegations of such for purposes of standing. The, one of the major distinctions between plaintiff's claims here and every previous census case is that their theory of harm is that individuals will violate their uh, duty to respond to the census and that that will cause that harm. So in other words, they're not challenging what the secretary has done to go out in the procedures to conduct the count, but their theory of harm relies on individuals making an independent decision to violate the law. The Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized that the standing inquiry is especially rigorous when the merits of the case would require a court to determine the constitutionality of an action taken by one of the other two branches. And here, plaintiffs fail to meet their burden because the claimed injury of lost funding and representation is not fairly traceable to the government's addition of a citizenship question. To establish standing, plaintiffs have to show that their injuries, the loss of funds or representation, are fairly traceable to the Secretary of Commerce's decision rather than resulting from the independent action of third parties that are not before the court. And the injuries that plaintiffs complain about here are exactly that, the independent choices of individuals who violate their duty to respond to the census. First of all, that would require us to speculate as to the cause. There are individuals who don't respond to the census in any event. In fact, in 2010, the self-response rate mailing back a census form was only 63.5%. So here, an individual who wouldn't respond to the census anyway and still fails to respond, there's no injury there attributable to the census question. So we have to uh, speculate as to why an individual doesn't respond to the census. Um, then we have to assume that the Bureau's extensive non-response follow-up will not capture. Assume in the development of the record of the case that they can identify one person who would otherwise have responded to the census, but then says because of the citizenship question, they would not be willing to do so. Doesn't that then address that? that it, wouldn't that then be a record on which you could proceed? Even if they found an individual who expressed their intention to respond without the question and they won't do so with it, that choice would still be the independent choice of that third party to violate the law and it would not be fairly attributable to the decision to reinstate a citizenship question. Um, uh, the Supreme Court in Clapper stated that the court has re re repeatedly expressed reluctance to endorse a standing theory that relies on guesswork as to how independent decision makers will exercise their judgment. And even if they could show that a person, as in your hypothetical, would be deterred simply by the reinstatement of the question and no other reason, courts have consistently refused to hold that justiciability requirements are met by the possibility that a party will violate valid criminal laws. That's the O'Shea case from 1974. That's exactly what you have here. As plaintiffs in their brief point out, there are cases where the action of a third party will not break the chain of causation such that any injury is attributable to the government action. But what's missing here is that in those cases, the government action has a determinative or coercive effect on the third party. For instance, in Bennett versus Speer, the Supreme Court rejected the government's ar argument that the injury that was claimed was not attributable to the government because it came from a third party, a Bureau of Reclamation that put in place water restrictions. But there the court said that although the harm technically resulted from a third party, that that third party didn't have independent choice, that if it were to reject the opinion of the government, it would do so at its own peril in the face of substantial penalties. Here, that inquiry is completely flipped on its head because the government is not coercing individuals to cause the harm that plaintiffs claim. It's quite the opposite. The government, if anything, is coercing individuals to respond to the census by having in place criminal laws that say you must. So there's not a direct determinative or coercive effect on a third party to cause the harm. 
Uh, this case is in uh, much like Simon versus East Kentucky Welfare. The court there held that the alleged injury, which was the denial of hospital services to indigent patients, was not fairly attributable to the government action because it was purely speculative whether the third parties denying hospital services would do so. In other words, it was an independent choice whether they granted hospital services to plaintiffs or not. Standing argument. How about your political question? With respect, Your Honor, that's just the traceability part. Would you like to hear about the injury or would you like me to move on to the political question? The injury question? in fact issue? Go yes, ahead. sir. We, we know it must be concrete and it can't be conjectural. Um, so uh, go ahead. Uh, in Clapper, the court stated that it is repeatedly reiterated that a threatened injury must be certainly impending to constitute injury in fact and that allegations of possible injury are insufficient. Here, plaintiffs are relying on a highly attenuated chain of, spe of possibilities that's too attenuated and not certainly impending. So first of all, you have to assume that there will be a lower initial self-response rate attributable to the addition of a citizenship question. Then you must assume that the Bureau's ex extensive non-response follow-up efforts fail to collect information on those individuals. Then you must assume that plaintiff states or localities are undercounted to a disproportionate degree, a greater extent than other jurisdictions. And then finally, you have to assume that that undercount is large enough to be material, considering both the magnitude of the undercount and the complex formulas that go into both apportionment and funding. That's simply too much speculation for, the, um, for this to be a concrete, particularized, and certainly impending injury. Um, in particular- I just don't see any way in which they could develop the record to show that. Well, at this point- I mean, All of these things are, uh, in, in a sense, assumptions to the extent that we're talking about, uh, you're at a motion to dismiss stage, um, but your position has to be that as a matter of law, they could never develop a record to answer the precise questions you've just articulated. What's your basis for that? I mean, th at this point, uh, it's, it's for you to prevail. It's got to be quite clear that there is no way this, uh, these uncertainties that you've said you've identified could ever be developed in a concrete fashion sufficient to proceed. And I don't know what your basis for that would be. Your Honor, our argument isn't that it's impossible for them to develop a record that would support standing. Our argument is that their allegations are insufficient. At this point, we're testing the sufficiency of the allegations in their complaint. And in particular, there are no allegations in the complaint specifically alleging that non-response follow-up efforts will fail um, and the opposition briefs fail to address this point. So to flesh that but they out. they allege a very concrete injury. Now you're saying, now the question is, can they demonstrate that that is indeed the fact? But the, the, the nature of the claim is quite concrete. It, it, it's not, it's easy to understand. It's quite uh, specific. And I'm having trouble understanding why you think uh, Usually, injury and fact issues, in my experience, come up when we don't really understand what you say has happened to you. Here, we know precisely what they say is, is the effect of what the Secretary proposes to include. And you're saying they're never going to be able to prove it. That's different, in my mind, than an inadequacy of, of an alleged injury and fact. But I'm trying to distinguish between um, saying that they would never be able to prove it with saying that their allegations here fail in a material respect. And so what I mean by that is that um, claiming that apportionment or representation, uh, apportionment or funds will be lost is itself concrete and has been held sufficient in other cases where there were allegations of a fundamentally different nature. Here what they're claiming is that the addition of a question is going to directly lead to those, and that's what's distinguishable. You have this very attenuated chain to get from, from point A to point B. So in particular, um, because this is a 12B1 argument, it is permissible to look outside the complaint. In particular, what we're pointing to are things that are capable of judicial notice. So as we've um, argued in our papers, the initial self-response rate to the census form is fairly low. In 2010, it was 63.5%. It's been on the decline for decades. By the end of the census in 2010, the extensive follow-up operations that were put in place resulted in a net overcount of 0.01% nationally. In other words, those non-response follow-up operations are extremely extensive and comprehensive. And what plaintiffs have failed to allege, they do allege that the addition of a question will result in um, people 
being deterred from participating. But what that means is that as the Commerce Secretary and Dr. Jarman in his memo have specifically acknowledged, there could be some initial difference of 0.5 to 1% in the initial self-response. That doesn't mean that the end result will be an undercount after the non-response follow-up operations are taken into account. And plaintiffs haven't put forth non-speculative concrete allegations that the non-response follow-up operations will be insu insufficient to capture information on those individuals. There's a very lengthy process where they complete mailings again and again. They visit um, at the very end if they cannot capture information on an individual and a housing unit is occupied. That information can either be gained from a proxy, meaning a landlord or a neighbor, or it can be imputed from the characteristics of individuals living nearby. That's how we result in a a very small net overcount in the last census. So all of those operations are, are very extensive, and what they haven't alleged is that that will fail. Um, in fact, the Ninth Circuit has specifically held that the causal chain is too weak to support standing at the pleading stage, where it involves numerous third parties whose independent decisions collectively have a significant effect on the plaintiff's injuries. That's Maya versus Centex Corp. Um, the closest that plaintiffs come in their complaint to alleging that the non-response follow-up will be insufficient is just saying that the question will repress responses, um, that it will make census data less accurate and reliable by likely reducing the number who will respond, um, things like that. That doesn't concretely address the non-response follow-up operations. If Your Honor has no further questions, I'll move on to the political question doctrine. Even if the plaintiffs had standing, this case is not reviewable for two reasons. The content of the census questionnaire is a political question because there exist no judicially manageable standards to govern the content of the census questionnaire. So the Constitution says that Congress, and by its delegation the Secretary, will conduct the census in such manner as they shall by law direct. And there's nothing in that to give the court a standard to apply here in reviewing the questions to be added to the census questionnaires because these are policy choices and value judgments that require the weighing of numerous factors. And that's what distinguishes this from other cases that have held that the census is not a political question. Those involved whether or not the secretary had put in place procedures to ensure an actual enumeration. That is an express constitutional command, and that's not a political question. That's, those are the how to count, who to count, where to count questions. You concede those are, those are subject to review. Yes, Your Honor, those are justiciable. So here, the difference you identify is that you, you, that their claims do not fit into any of those characterizations? Yes, Your Honor. Um, as Justice Stevens explained in his dissent in House of Representatives, the words actual enumeration require that every apportionment post-1787 is based on an actual population count, not speculation or a bare estimate. But they do not purport to limit the authority of Congress to direct the manner in which such counts should be made. So a court can review whether or not the Secretary is fulfilling the constitutional command to conduct an actual enumeration. Previous cases that have concerned the calculation methodology, whether imputation or statistical sampling are permissible, those go directly to the heart of the question whether the Secretary is conducting a person-by-person -person head count. But the extent to which the Secretary can exercise his discretion to gather information, demographic information from the U.S. population, that's a very different inquiry. The standard can't be, as plaintiffs put forth, that it must be the pursuit of accuracy above all other considerations. First of all, that would be unworkable. How is a court to determine whether any particular aspect of a massive operation to count 325 million people is designed to achieve accuracy? That requires a complex balancing of cost testing, et cetera. The here, that the reason is that uh, I can understand if the, if the issue was a question that the plaintiffs were saying that they're included on the census that the plaintiffs say is under, other, an otherwise inappropriate question. I mean, just totally uh, improper in mm -hmm. some general sense. You know, question on the census that says, do you, do you support the current administration's policies or some ridiculous question? And your position there would be, well, but there may be problems with that question, but it's, and perhaps maybe it's arbitrary and capricious or what have you, but it, it's, 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 it's a political question. Here, they're, they're alleging that the question has a direct impact on the counting process. And you say it doesn't, and it's speculative and the, and the like, but that is their claim. And so it is, in a sense, 
impacting the uh, the how to count the the uh, in a way the who to count, um, not so much the where to count, I suppose. So it's a matter of how you characterize it, and in, in, in their characterization is it falls within that. So why are they wrong? Because the Constitution expressly granted the power to review that to Congress, and Congress reserved it for itself in passing the Census Act. But you acknowledge that if, it, in fact, if it falls within the rubric of, of uh, um, the process by which you're actually doing the count, you acknowledge that that can be subject to review. So it's just sort of how you're characterizing their question. And they're saying, you're, you're not giving a fair uh, reading of what their claim is. Well, Baker itself, and Baker versus Carr itself, emphasized that the political question doctrine is a need for a case-by-case -case inquiry. And so I would resist the characterization that this is just a question of who to count and where to count, because the Secretary has put in place extensive procedures that have been developed over uh, more than the last decade to go out and conduct a complete and accurate enumeration. And so they haven't challenged that aspect. They haven't alleged that the Secretary has done something um, that means that there will not be a person-by-person headcount conducted throughout the nation. Here, what they're alleging is just that the addition of a demographic question that, in fact, has been collected on the census as far back as 1820 is going to have a disproportionate impact. Stopped in 1950. Right. It moved from the short form to the long form in 1950. And, Your Honor, accepting their theory of harm would mean that the long form itself was unconstitutional. Um, it's well established. It's demonstrable that when... They're, but they're saying more than that. They're saying, effectively, that this is a poison pill to the count being included for purposes of impacting the count and, and depressing it. That's a different proposition than, than uh, well, the, the, the simple fact that at a different moment in time that question was included in some form, the long form or uh, somewhere else within the census, begs the question to some extent because we do have to look at it on a case-by-case -case basis and the, and the time in which it is, this question is proposed to be included. So the simple fact it was included in a prior version doesn't mean for all time and in all context it's, it's uh, perfectly permissible. Your Honor, we would submit that there are no judicially manageable standards to determine when a question is permissible and when it's not. For the political question doctrine purposes, there need to be judicially manageable standards derived from the Constitution. And nothing in the constitutional text will permit a court to weigh whether one question is permissible and another is not, whether questions on race, age, sex, and Hispanic origin. Unless they fall into the how, where, when to count, which you acknowledge would then be subject to review. Well, let me give a hypothetical. So the, the content of the questionnaire itself, uh, we think, does not fall within that. If there were an allegation that the secretary had put in place procedures where enumerators would go out and conduct follow-up in one region of the country, but in another region of the country they would not, and if 63.5% once again returned their census forms but there were no follow-up operations at all, that would implicate the procedures put in place uh, to conduct an actual enumeration. That would be an allegation that he was not fully instituting the constitutional command. The proposition you're advancing, if I understand it correctly, is that the content of a question, uh, I can't even think of a hypothetical that would satisfy your, your um, view that the content of a question is simply not reviewable because it's a political question. There's no question the content of which under your theory, would be subject to review by the court. Our theory is that the content of the questionnaire itself, um, there are no judicially manageable standards to apply to that. So it would not do, it would not turn on what the question is. It turns on what the claim is itself. Um, also, the the standard that plaintiffs press in this argument, the pursuit of accuracy would mean that no question past the count itself would ever pass constitutional muster because any demographic question could dissuade someone and in fact demonstrably does. Um, that totally flies in the face of historical practice. Demographic information has been conducted ever since the first census. Um, and in some years the census form was far more onerous and contained more questions than it does today. The, as I mentioned earlier, the practice of sending out a long-form questionnaire would itself be unconstitutional. And no one has ever claimed that. And in fact, that, that, um, 
that cannot be the case, that the use of the long-form questionnaire itself. In years when the Census Bureau used a long-form questionnaire, it did not also mail a short-form questionnaire to those same households. One in six households only received a long-form questionnaire, and those households had a materially lower initial response rate when they got the initial form. Um, but there's no claim that that was itself unconstitutional for decades, and in fact, such a contention would would, would be absurd. Um, so again, Congress reserved for itself when it passed the Census Act the power to review whether or not the choices that the Secretary makes in designing the form and content of the questionnaire are permissible. Uh, that's why Secretary Ross had to submit the content of the questionnaire to Congress two years in advance, and it's for Congress to set that aside if they think that he has erred in that decision. I would also say that while, as you pointed out, courts have routinely heard challenges to the Census, they have exclusively or almost exclusively involve challenges to the counting methodology, which is demonstrably different. Uh, and to be two of your other claims. that You have the, uh, an argument, if, if again I understand it correctly, that uh, both the standing and the political question arguments go to all of the claims in both of the cases. But then you have specific objection or specific uh, grounds for making a motion to dismiss on the EPA claims and then the enumeration clause claims. So can you go to those specific uh, bases for your motion? Certainly, Your Honor. As to the APA claim, it is not reviewable because Congress committed the form and content of the census questionnaire to the Secretary's discretion. And there's no- Kind of a political question argument, but specific to the APA context, right? It's analogous, but it the, the inquiry is whether the Census Act uh, provides law to apply uh, in reviewing that question. So it's a little bit of a different inquiry, but certainly analogous. Um, the APA, of course, forecloses judicial review of matters that have been committed to agency discretion by law under 701A2 of the APA. And a matter is committed to the agency's discretion when there is no law to apply and thus no meaningful standard against which to judge the exercise of the Secretary's discretion. The Census Act uh, conveys that discretion with very broad language. The Secretary shall take a decennial census of population in such form and content as he may determine. He's also author authorized to gather such other information as necessary. And here the information gathering procedures are committed to the Secretary because the statute is devoid of, suggest of standards suggesting what Congress How intended. How does the arbitrary and capricious concept play into that? I mean, well, it I'm sorry. But no, go ahead. In order to reach arbitrary and capricious review, you first have to determine that 701A2 doesn't foreclose review whatsoever. So the arbitrary and capricious standard itself cannot provide law to apply. Otherwise, 701A2 would be devoid of meaning. So if Your Honor rejected our APA argument, then you would be reviewing whether it was arbitrary and capricious. But the arbitrary and capricious is not itself the standard to okay. apply. So, so under your theory of the, of the APA, there's, there's simply no question, no matter how absurd, would be subject to review? Yes, Your Honor, because the Congress, in passing the Census Act, c gave the Secretary that discretion and did not... Very using that example I gave earlier, could put a question on the Census that said, do you support the current administration's policies and, and views on X? That'd be unreviewable. It Patently would... absurd, but uh, uh, unreviewable. Should the Secretary put a patently absurd question on the Census Questionnaire, then Congress certainly has the authority to set that aside. The courts do not have uh, any role to play. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, the Ninth Circuit has specifically stated that the determination of whether or not something is committed to agency discretion must be made in the context of a particular complaint. So that doesn't mean that no question implicating the Census Act can be reviewable under the APA. Certainly cases challenging census procedures have been reviewed under the APA. That is the case, but this is where this argument dovetails with the political question argument, is that the form and content is something that there aren't standards to apply. Um, as the Ninth Circuit said in Abdel Hamid, uh, the test is not whether a statute viewed in the abstract lacks law to be applied, but whether in a given case there is law to be applied. And it went on to further state that there will not be jurisdiction where the alleged abuse of discretion consists only of making an informed judgment by the agency. And here that's exactly what happened. The secretary weighed cost, testing, accuracy, the need for information, and made a determination. So this is simply an informed judgment by the agency for which there is no law to apply. The statutory language here is analogous to that in Webster. 
Um, in Webster, the Supreme Court held that the CIA director's termination decision was not reviewable because it committed to his discretion um, when he shall deem that termination is advisable or necessary. And here the language that the secretary may determine the content of the census questionnaire is directly analogous to that language. None of the cases that plaintiffs have cited, none of the census cases that have been held to be reviewable under the APA, address the question that's presented here. The question whether the Census Act provides any standards by which to judge their content. All of those involved calculation methodologies, again, rather than information gathering functions. Um, plaintiffs further try to state that there is law to apply derived from Congress's direction in the Census Act to pursue as accurate as possible an enumeration. That can't possibly be the standard to apply here, to provide law to apply, because again, if that were the case, no information gathering function would ever survive scrutiny. It would also put courts in the role of weighing all of the factors that go into the complex undertaking um, that is committed to the Secretary's dis Ms. discretion. Ms. Furman disagreed with you in his recent opinion. Did, Your Honor. We respectfully disagree with that opinion. Yes. Pardon? We respectfully disagree with yes. that opinion but on this when, point. When you said for just, and it's uh, not binding authority in on a district court in the Ninth Circuit, but you said no, you know, no court has has gone this direction, and he very recently did. So uh, there is certainly persuasive authority that is contrary to your view on this precise question. Uh, it, Judge Furman's opinion, or Judge so, Furman's opinion. First of all, there are a couple of, of cases, circuit level cases, that were um, considering other questions under the Census Act that did hold that it committed to the Secretary's discretion by law. That's the Tucker and the Mosbacher case from the Seventh and Ninth Circuits. Um, we um, think that reasoning supports our position, but of course they were different claims. However, what Judge Furman failed to distinguish was the fact that the claim presented in this case is fundamentally unlike the claim presented in earlier cases. So it is not our position that any question about the census is committed to the Secretary's discretion by law. We're not saying that 13 U.S.C. 141 means that no question related to the census <coughs> may be reviewed under the APA. That's not the case. What we're saying is that it's a claim-specific inquiry, and this is where the, the argument is very similar to the political question. It's that the Secretary, I'm sorry, Sorry, Congress did not put into the Census Act any particular standards constraining the Secretary's discretion about information gathering functions. There simply is no standard in the Act to govern this particular question. So for instance, the Supreme Court has reviewed whether or not the Census Act permitted statistical sampling. It found that the Census Act does not. The Supreme Court reviewed whether or not the Census Act and the Enumeration Clause will permit the Secretary um, to use hot deck imputation to imputate addresses where there is no response. Those are things for which there is a standard, but there just is no standard for the form of the questionnaire. Um, lastly, on this point, plaintiffs cite regulations and state that that provides law to apply. It doesn't. Uh, they're citing amorphous standards from the Paperwork Reduction Act, from OMB directives, from uh, Census Bureau's policies, um, that they should test forms or maximize data quality. But these are vague directives. Um, they're not sufficient to transform the nature of the agency action from an exercise of virtually unlimited discretion, as the Supreme Court has emphasized, into one that's reviewable. Um, the Paperwork Reduction Act also contains no judicially enforceable private right of action, no standards to apply. I mean, in other words, these are just amorphous direction that doesn't provide standards here to be applied. Okay. The uh, enumeration clause claims, that's where Judge Furman went with you. Uh, so, why don't you give me the benefit of your views on that? Uh, even assuming that plaintiff's claims are reviewable, the constitutional claim fails, as Judge Furman found. Um, as a threshold matter, the Supreme Court has emphasized that the Secretary is entitled to significant deference in this area, so their claim must be viewed through that lens. Um, we don't think that Wisconsin's um, standard is what applies here, but the Supreme Court in Wisconsin emphasized that the Constitution vests Congress with virtually unlimited discretion in conducting the census, and that's what Congress has given to the Secretary here. Um, so as Judge Furman emphasized in his opinion, the inquiry under the Enumeration Clause is an objective inquiry. In other words, it doesn't turn on the Secretary's intent or on the political climate or on these various factors that plaintiffs cite to. Under the Enumeration Clause, the Secretary either has the authority to collect this information or he does not. Um, 
Nothing in the Constitution forecloses asking about citizenship. In fact, as we discussed earlier, this information has been collected dating as far back as 1820, and it's been on the uh, form that was sent to at least a portion of the population to measure for the actual enumeration as recently as 2000. So accepting plaintiff's argument that the enumeration clause bars collection of this information would mean that most of the censuses conducted in our nation's history were unconstitutional. And that simply cannot be the case. The only limitation in the Constitution... Well, I'm not sure. The fact that prior conduct uh, uh, in, in a subsequent analysis might then, one would conclude if you were going back to that period of time that there was some problems with it. It isn't, the, the simple fact that uh, that happened doesn't necessarily mean it, it was without constitutional problems. Was there ever a contest on this question that, I mean, this issue has not been brought up as I understand, correct? I mean the issue specifically whether yes, citizenship? whether or not this question has a chilling effect, uh, and I don't think that's ever been uh, litigated, has it? No, Your Honor. In fact, there oh, has the a fact that th that this question had uh, been included in uh, it is certainly a relevant fact for you to present to me, and I'm not suggesting that it's of no consequence. But I don't think the fact that it's been included in some form or another in prior uh, prior census instances means, well, therefore, it must be constitutional. I mean, it, perhaps it's never been brought up before, and indeed, it doesn't appear to have been. Uh, well, in fact, there hasn't been a facial challenge to a question on the census questionnaire right. before at all. There have been challenges in the context of a criminal prosecution that were rejected as meritless. Uh, but there's never been a case just challenging whether or not a question could be included on the census form. However, the argument is we, w we agree with Judge Furman that the inquiry under the enumeration clause is an objective inquiry. In other words, the question either is constitutionally permissible or it's not. Um, Judge Furman disagreed with us on whether the, cons the, the form, it's, any question would be reviewable, of course, but he even pointed out that um, if this question could not be on the form, that the use of it on the long form as recently as 2000 would be constitutionally impermissible, or the use of the long form itself would be impermissible if the accuracy standard was what governed here. In other words, this question has been included again and again on the, con on the census form. The Supreme Court has emphasized the importance of historical practice in analyzing what is constitutionally permissible in conducting the census, and were it unconstitutional to add a citizenship question, to collect information on citizenship, then all of the censuses where that information has been collected would be constitutionally suspect. They would have violated the Constitution. In other words, there's nothing in the enumeration clause itself that provides any reason to hold that collection of the information is permissible in some decennial, decennial enumerations, but not in others. It just simply can't be the case. Well, it doesn't give as much guidance at all. It doesn't address that question. That's precisely why what's on the questionnaire is a political question, Your Honor. Uh, however, plaintiffs claim that the citizenship question violates the Constitution because it will cause an undercount as meritless, because under that theory, then every census that's ever conducted that had demographic questions that would in some way decrease the count would be constitutionally impermissible. Um, the Supreme Court has emphasized the importance of demographic information, that the uh, census is used not only to conduct the constitutionally mandated enumeration for purposes of apportionment, but also to gather incredibly important information on the U.S. population. So it simply can't be that just at reinstating this question on the forum is necessarily impermissible. Um, as Judge Furman noted, the Wisconsin standard that plaintiffs press is not applicable. The Supreme Court did put forth the Wisconsin standard about um, a decision must be reasonably related to conducting the constitutional purpose in the context of calculation methodology. And that standard makes perfect sense when you're analyzing whether or not a choice by the secretary about how he's going to count the population, whether or not that will lead to an actual enumeration. But the Supreme Court didn't state that any decision, even tangentially related to conducting the census, must be reviewed to be reasonably related to the constitutional goal. Um, I'll put it this way, if that were the standard that applied to the plaintiff's enumeration clause claim, then simply collecting information on race, age, sex, or Hispanic origin 
would be suspect as well because it would be uh, you would not be able to show that those decisions were reasonably related to the constitutional goal of conducting an actual enumeration. Those questions are on the census form for other reasons. For instance, information on race is collected for enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. That's not reasonably related to the purpose of conducting an enumeration for purposes of apportionment. So all of the questions on the form past the actual count would be constitutionally impermissible were the Wisconsin standard to apply to demographic information intent, collection. I know you say and point out that it's an objective standard we're utilizing here, but if a record were to develop that showed that there was a intent to use a particular question for the purpose of obtaining an undercount, um, if at the end of the day that's what the, the record showed, I'm not suggesting that that's what the record is now, but wouldn't that then present perhaps an enumeration clause uh, violation? If, if it were shown that a question were added specifically to depress the count, there still would be no judicially manageable so standard to determine that. if we had a record that. now, if, if we had a statement or something that from the secretary that said, I want to include this because I'm, I, I really do want to, in certain areas, uh, ensure that the count is, is chilled, if you will, th that would violate the enumeration clause, wouldn't it? Because it would be uh, a, a, an affirmative effort to uh, obtain an, uh, you know, a, a less than um, appropriate count, which is what the enumeration clause is directed towards doing. It's directed towards getting a ca an accurate count. And if, this, if the secretary said, I'm including this question in order to get uh, less than an accurate count, that would violate the enumeration clause, wouldn't it? I don't think they would still, first of all, that would be still a very different claim. case. You couldn't, you couldn't bring an enumeration clause claim if you had a, the Secretary of Commerce saying, I want this question because um, in certain parts of the country, I want to make sure we, we don't count everybody. And this question's going to do that. I know that's not what's there. But I, I'm just trying to test what is the, is, is it really your position that the enumeration clause almost is never subject to being violated? It cannot be violated by virtue of, a, of including a question on the, it doesn't matter what the question is, it could never violate the enumeration clause. The inclusion of a question would still not be reviewable because there wouldn't be a standard to apply from the Constitution. I understand. Yes, Your Honor. I understand. Um, but that would be, a, again, a very different case from what we have here. Um, if you had an allegation there that the Secretary had designed something particularly to repress response rates, that would be a different case than here. That's what they say has happened. So it's a different case in the sense that you say that's not what happened. Um, they say that is what happened, and there may be a question about whether or not they have a sufficient basis to bring the claim. But on a theoretical basis, assuming they were right, would that be, you're saying even if they were right, it's not an enumeration clause violation? There still would be no judicially manageable standard derived from the enumeration, yes, Your Honor. That still would not be reviewable. Were that the case, it would certainly be for Congress to overturn that decision. Uh, Congress is entrusted with ensuring that an actual enumeration is conducted, yes. But there would not be a standard to apply to whether or not a question itself is permissible. Again, I would emphasize that the citizenship Remedy question... would be impeach the Secretary of Commerce, presumably. Well... It wouldn't even have to go that far. That would be another choice for Congress to make, but all Congress would have to do is pass legislation directing that the question be removed from the questionnaire, and it certainly can do so. In fact, up until um, 50 years ago, Congress did direct the form of the questionnaire. Um, and so that actually is a very important point in this analysis, because in many of the censuses where information on citizenship was collected, it was explicitly directed by Congress, and there's just never been a suggestion before. That's what makes this case so unique. There's never before been a case alleging that the secretary is constrained in any way in his demographic information gathering functions. Very good. Let me uh, hear from whoever wants to step forward on the defense side. and To give me sort of a preview of who wants to speak, uh, my understanding, Ms. Poutine, you're going to lead off. And then uh, anyone else want to address these issues? Yes, Your Honor, I will introduce Mr. Chosen on, on behalf of the uh, city Okay. Very good. All right, Ms. Poutine. <clears throat> I would like to start with the enumeration clause claim. Okay. Uh, in the Wisconsin case, the Supreme Court articulated the standard applicable to the Secretary of Con 
versus general conduct of the senses. His acts must bear a, quote, reasonable relationship to the accomplishment of an actual enumeration of the population, keeping in mind the constitutional purpose of the census. The opinion makes clear that the only constitutional purpose of the census is apportionment. It is not gathering demographic information. This rule makes sense. It gives the secretary a level of deference, but it also limits his ability to take steps that would threaten the accuracy of the congressional apportionment, which is one of the fundamental building blocks of democratic government. The California complaint alleges facts that meet the Wisconsin standard. We have alleged that Secretary Ross decided to add the citizenship question, that the question will cause an undercount of certain groups, particularly immigrants and non-citizens, that due to California's demographics, that undercount will be disproportionately large in California as compared to other states, and that as a result, California will likely cause, excuse me, this, the citizenship question will likely cause California to lose at least one congressional seat. These are sufficient allegations to state a, call, a claim under the enumeration clause. Defendants argue that no matter what the effects on congressional apportionment, the only requirement of the enumeration clause is that the census be conducted by a person-by-person -person headcount rather than estimation or conjecture. Uh, there are a couple of reasons why this is incorrect. First, no court has, including the Supreme Court, has actually set forth that rule. Uh, no court has limited the application of the enumeration clause to issues of headcount versus estimation. Um, that issue pops up in some minority opinions, but no court has ever actually held that. And although the Census Act prohibits sampling for the purpose of congressional apportionment, uh, no court has held that that prohibition also comes from the enumeration clause. Second, the Wisconsin court did not limit its rule to the issue of headcount versus estimate. The standard explicitly refers to, quote, the secretary's conduct of the census, end quote, not to the secretary's choice of estimation versus headcount. Third, uh, the defendant's interpretation of the rule is also inconsistent with the Wisconsin decision itself. In that case, uh, the secretary had chosen not to statistically stamp, sample um, and the court held that that was consistent with the enumeration clause because it bore a reasonable relationship to achieving, achieving enumeration for the purpose of apportionment. The court walked through the secretary's determination to assess its reasonableness, particularly with respect to the goal of distributive accuracy. If the enumeration that, clause- That is though very different than the, uh, the issue of selecting a question to be included on the uh, in the census, and certainly, as as the government suggests, there, you know, there are many demographic questions that have been included in the in the census, and uh, the Wisconsin case doesn't support the concept that you can uh, analyze each question for whether or not it might have an impact one way or the other on what the ultimate count is going to be. It does to the extent that it would affect congressional apportionment. We recognize that and every demographic question potentially could have that impact. That's not necessarily so, Your Honor. Um, there's not necessarily a one-to-one -one correlation between an undercount and the uh, apportionment of representatives. There can be an undercount. First of all, most undercounts are fairly reasonably distributed among, fairly evenly distributed among the states. They're not necessarily uh, larger in one state than another. They also would have to be of sufficient magnitude to make a difference, and and likely a case would all. A, excuse me, a state would also have to be on the bubble probably already, which California is in this case. So it's not the case that every demographic question such as uh, sex, race, um, uh, relationship status, those aren't questions, first of all, that are unusually sensitive the way that the citizenship question is here to the extent that people would refuse to answer it. And even if it were, there's nothing to say that there are no circumstances suggesting that their undercount would be greater in one state than another as there is here. So this is a very unique circumstance. So it's not, it's not an issue of every question being subject to the Wisconsin standard. State of California might have a claim where another state wouldn't have a claim? That's correct, Your Honor. That's correct. If, if there were an undercount in another state, but it would not put at risk their, their number of representatives, some states only have one representative. They're definitely going to have one representative. So if there's an undercount there, they're not going to be affected by that demographic question. So it, this, is, this is 
a case that is, is unique because of the unusual... So the question will potentially violate the enumeration clause for California, but it won't violate the, the same exact question wouldn't violate Vermont's uh, interests. It, or it or wouldn't not, be an enumeration clause violation. I don't know specifically about the state of Vermont, but assuming that there's... one representative. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I would say it would still violate the Constitution because the, uh, the overall apportionment would be affected. It's that California would be injured, whereas Vermont likely wouldn't be. So Vermont probably couldn't... Theory in fact. That's right. Okay. That's right. For Vermont, it is. Okay. Right. And I think it's important um, to note that in the New York case, um, this bright line rule of the effect on congressional apportionment was not addressed either by the parties or by the court. There was instead just this focus on overall accuracy. And we're not arguing that a perfectly accurate count is required or that every single action by the secretary must improve overall accuracy. We're not saying that every demographic question is a problem because people will trail off the longer the form is. Again, we're only saying if a particular question is so unique and, and sensitive that it would affect how many representatives the state of California or another state gets, in that case... Does it matter at all to, your, to this claim from your perspective of the intent involved in asking the question by the secretary? No, I don't think it does matter. Um, I think in either event, as long as it would have the effect, I think the effect is what matters here. I think intent is probably more of an APA-related question, but um, I, I think either... If he had the intent or if he didn't, I think what matters is, is it reasonable knowing what the result is likely to be for congressional apportionment? Now, Judge Furman went through a very thorough historical analysis on the enumeration clause question and concluded at the end of that process that uh, there was not a basis here for a claim under the enumeration clause. And you've read his analysis, I'm sure. Um, Where's the flaw in that analysis? So the flaw is is that it does not address um, the the kind of I don't know if I would say it's a bright line, but the limit uh, of congressional apportionment. It only refers to the overall scheme of accuracy, and it doesn't have kind of a, a limiting point on how 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 much can a certain act affect accuracy before it's unconstitutional. And then and so he looked at, at the history and he said, you know. It's always been allowed before, and and there, and so there's no way to say that demographic questions can't be allowed because they've always been on the census, and there's always been a recognition that they, they perform an important purpose. But he also did not distinguish between the fact that demographic questions are not part of the constitutional purpose of the census. The census only recognizes, excuse me, the Constitution only recognizes uh, congressional apportionment as a purpose. So you can't yes, use... But you're, you're not contending, as I understand it, that uh, the simple act of including a question that is not directed towards obtaining an accurate count would violate the enumeration Correct. clause, I right? You, because we've had, that is a kind of an, would be an untenable position. Right, and I don't, and I don't think that the Wisconsin test can be read so finely as to say that this would prevent any question from being added because it's not unreasonable for Democrat for demographic questions to be added if they're not affecting congressional apportionment. And so I think that reading of this test is going a little bit too far. Um, just want, and I guess just to close the loop on the Wisconsin case, um, I, I think if all that were at issue is whether, they're, whether it's a headcount or estimation being used, the fact that the secretary used, was choosing to do a headcount would have made it a very short opinion. The court wouldn't have even had to formulate a standard generally for reviewing the secretary's conduct. They just would have said, oh, your, your, your conduct is constitutional. You were required to do this. And that would be the analysis rather than what we have in that case. How about the just the quite simple argument that the government advances that um, the citizenship question has been on in some form or another. I know it's in different places in the census, and I, I recognize that. But it's been there before, and, to, and their argument is to, to take the position now that there's a potential enumeration clause violation in this instance would it, it simply fly in the face of the historical fact that it's been included. Uh, it would be saying we've had unconstitutional census proceedings going way back. 
Um, well, I think your response <laughs> to that issue was actually on point um, in that there hasn't been a challenge to the citizenship question before. It is possible that it could have been unconstitutional in the past. We certainly don't have the facts before us but about- But I, I take it you don't necessarily say it was. No, I'm not you're, saying you're it was, saying, but it could have been. If I understand it correctly, that it's the, the context in which the question arises, the times in which we live, have some relevance to the analysis. Right. If in 1950 um, a, a complaint had been filed where they, where they alleged the same circumstances here, uh, then that motion to dismiss should have been denied as well, despite the fact that prior to 1950 no lawsuit had been brought. I think that may be it as far as the enumeration clause. Sure. Also, the overarching yeah. standing political question issues. Sure. So the defendants argue that under Section 701A2 of the APA, the defendants' actions are, quote, committed to agency discretion by law and thus unreviewable. As a starting point, there's a strong presumption of APA reviewability that can only be rebutted with clear and convincing evidence, and the defendants have not met that burden. And that's because, in this case, there are meaningful judicial standards to apply here. Those standards do not have to come from the text of the Census Act itself. And, and defendants have only pointed to the Census Act when saying that there are no judicially manageable standards. First, uh, the APA can be violated with unconstitutional acts. Here, again, we've got the standard of review in Wisconsin for what constitutes an unconstitutional act. Two, we have statutes. There's 13 U.S.C. 141 that requires the census to be as accurate as possible. There's Section 2 U.S.C. 2A, which requires the secretary to tabulate the whole number of persons in each state. And as Judge Stevens said uh, in the Franklin uh, minority opinion, this, these two statutes show that there's a duty to conduct a census that is accurate and fairly accounts for representational rights. And although accuracy, again, does not form a easy, bright line standard, certainly when we're talking about APA review, if we, if, we, if we show, and we expect to show, that the Secretary's purpose and objectively the citizenship question does not assist in Voting Rights Act enforcement, then on one hand you have a decrease to the accuracy of the census, which will affect federal funding even if it does not affect uh, apportionment. And on the other hand, you have no, no legitimate justification for the act. And, and, a, and a government action under APA review has to rise and fall on the state of justification. And third, uh, we've got, we've got uh, regulations under the Pope Work Rejection Act as well as agency policies, including the Census Bureau's statistical quality standards. <laughs> and under the Me Mendez Gutierrez case and Pinnacle, we know in the Ninth Circuit that courts don't have to look at official regulations. They can also look at established agency policies and that those policies don't even have to be legally binding um, on an agency to constitute a manageable standard. In this case, again, the burden is on defendants to show that there's no meaningful judicial standard. We also are engaging in discovery into, a, into agency policies and practices. So there could be additional standards that we believe are appropriate to use for APA review that we will determine on discover, in discovery. So they certainly have not proven that as a matter of law, there are no judicially manageable standards. Uh, the defendant's uh, counsel mentioned the Tucker and Mossbacher cases. Um, and I would just uh, reiterate what's in our brief, which is that Tucker was decided before Wisconsin. Um, and, and there certainly now is a, a Wisconsin standard for the um, constitutional aspect of an APA claim. Um, and the Tucker case does not appear to challenge um, the, the defendant's decision-making process leading up to the agency action, um, whereas here <laughs> it does. And again, there, 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 it doesn't appear that there were, in, well, we know that there were no uh, Public Paperwork Reduction Act <laughs> regulations um, and certain policies, again, at the time of the Tucker decision. With respect to the Mossbacher case um, that had to do with whether or not the Constitution and census statutes required the secretary to disclose documents related to census methodology that was not implemented. 
And the court found specifically that there were no standards, manageable standards, to determine when those laws required the post-census disclosure of documents. That issue specifically, which is a far cry from our case here. And I believe that's all I have on APA reviewability. I'm happy to go to Standy now. I will begin with the issue of actual injury. At the pleading stage, all that's required are general factual allegations. And as the Lujan case said, we may presume from general allegations those specific facts that are necessary to support the claim. We have to apply here the Ninth Circuit test for whether a plaintiff threatened with future injury is at a substantial risk that the harm will occur. That is the test from the Henry Zappos case, the Susan B. Anthony case, and also the Clapper case, which also cited the certainly impending standard, but in the footnote noted that the substantial risk case is also applied. With respect to apportionment injury, in no less than four Supreme Court cases related to the census, the court has explicitly or implicitly held that loss of a number of congressional representatives constitutes a cognizable injury. Here, we allege that California faces a substantial risk that that will happen. And the allegations are more than plausible, and it is not an attenuated series of implausible inferences. We have simply alleged that the question has been added. The Bureau has long held the position and acknowledged that a citizenship question will create an undercount, so there's not really much of an inference there. There's a political climate in which there is more fear among non-citizens about what the government will do with their information, and that is, again, according to the Bureau's own fall 2017 study. And there is the fact that California has a disproportionately high number of these demographic groups, and then that this comparative difference will cause California to lose a congressional seat. These are not implausible inferences. It's simply a chain of causation. I think with any claim, there's a chain of causation where you can break it down into component parts, and each component part, of course, has to be proven, but that doesn't mean that the allegations are implausible or that causation is too attenuated, certainly not at the pleading stage. The defendants will have the opportunity down the road to disprove that any of what they consider inferences will actually occur. The defendants argue that the plaintiffs have only pled that there will be an undercount with respect to the initial response rate, in other words, the response to the questionnaires, as opposed to the follow-up visits of enumerators, but it is not our burden to distinguish between the questionnaire response as opposed to the response when the enumerator comes to the door. We pled the responses generally will go down and that the ultimate count will be affected. In paragraph 5, we say, asking about the citizenship question will repress responses from citizens and their non-citizen relatives. That encompasses, fairly read, the way that pleadings should be read, that encompasses responding to enumerators who come to their door. We should not have to plead that at every step of the way, yes, they will respond to the questionnaire or the first enumerator or the second enumerator. Paragraph 9, we allege that adding the citizenship question will directly cause an undercount. And then in paragraph 37, we say the Bureau's own fall 2017 study shows about concerns in participating in the census. These are broad terms, and logically speaking, of course we mean the overall response because we're talking about the consequences of the overall response. I believe there's an additional allegation that does specifically address follow-up in the sense that in paragraph 38, we say that the Bureau will be unable to take sufficient measures to avoid or mitigate the undercount. A question? Sure. I'm sorry, do you see you have a question? No, I said political question. Oh, sure. If I may, Your Honor, also on standing, just reiterate that when it comes to causation, the Mendea case 
uh, standard applies here in the Ninth Circuit, which is that the government conduct must be a substantial factor. And that case actually cites the Bennett case with, um, in uh, in setting forth that test. So the so it is interprets the Bennett case, which is cited by defendants. So with respect to the political question doctrine, defendants have not and cannot cite a single census-related case that has been held to pose a political question. Because courts have uniformly held that the doctrine does not bar the government's fulfillment of its, uh, the court's consideration of the government's fulfillment of its census duties. And this case is no different. They argue that because the enumeration clause states that the enumeration shall be made in such manner as Congress shall direct, that this is a textual commitment of that manner to the exclusion of review by the judiciary. But there are several reasons why that is not actually a textual commitment. First, we have to look at the test for what does constitute textual commitment, and the Supreme Court tells us that text in Nixon, and that is that the text has to make clear that the delegation of authority is to that political branch, quote, and nowhere else, and the text does not do that here. There are also numerous cases in which the court actually characterizes its review as being uh, of the secretary's conduct that is pursuant to the in such manner clause. So they actually have reviewed conduct under that uh, clause before uh, in the Wisconsin case, in the Utah case, uh, Kerry case. Um, again, in those cases, the courts themselves say that that's what they're doing. And then uh, for the second part of the test for political question doctrine, we go to judicially manageable standards. For the numeration clause claim, again, clause claim, again that is Wisconsin. And for the APA clause claim, um, that was discussed in, uh, in my statements on the APA review. Let me ask you just on, on to understand these two complaints and how they are similar and how they may be somewhat slightly different. On the, uh, your claim, the, the state of California claim, uh, you've got APA and you've got one claim for relief on the enumeration clause. And then San Jose uh, and BLJI uh, break it down. They have an enumeration clause claim and then an apportionment clause, Article um, 14th Amendment, Section 2 claim. Uh, when I'm looking at those, is there an appreciable difference? I know I'm not asking you to say yours is better than the other, but uh, <laughs> just from an analytical point of view, are you, are, you, are you advancing different things in those claims? I don't believe so. I think that question may be better answered by San Jose. I know there is um, language related to the enumeration and the um, obligation to count the whole number of persons in each state in the 14th Amendment. So I believe they are, they are the same, but um, but They're I phrased I'll somewhat to, differently. Okay, yeah, but yeah, from your defer. perspective, you're, you're not, you don't see your claim as being appreciably different than the San Jose enumeration claim. Yes, we've been, we've been operating under that understanding. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, well, let me hear from, thank you. Let me hear from San Jose and BLJI. Thank you, Your Honor, and good morning. Emil Petrosian from Manat, Phelps & Phillips on behalf of City of San Jose and the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, which for purposes of brevity I'll refer to as Baji this morning. Um, well, that gets confusing with the California pattern jury instructions, but okay. It, it does, and, and we've had that discussion internally. So um, uh, referring to Black Alliance for Just Immigration today. So um, first and foremost, uh, to the extent that uh, uh, my, my co-counsel's argument this morning is applicable, I'd just like to join in it. Um, I would appreciate, and I'm sure you will do this for me, uh, very good arguments thus far, and we can incorporate those and not just go over the same ground. So go ahead. We, we have been going for well over an hour, and I understand that, Your Honor. I will try my best to be systematic and address some of the issues that Your Honor has raised this morning. So the first thing I want to address is, is the enumerations clause claim, because I think um, we're, we're reaching sort of a, an understanding of what the, what the exact standard here is. And Your Honor asked a question at the beginning of the colloquy with the defense counsel. You asked, are there any limits on the Secretary's power uh, to conduct the census? 
And my understanding of, of defendants' argument this morning and in their papers is that you have to draw a distinction between the manner in which the census is conducted versus the content of the questionnaire. Um, the how, the who, the where versus Annex, the content. Know. Exactly. Um, respectfully, Your Honor, we think that drawing that sort of distinction would exalt form over substance. And we think it's, it's really an exercise in semantics. Wisconsin provides the standard. And if I may, Your Honor, I'd like to just remind the court of exactly what Wisconsin says, because I think it's important. Wisconsin says that so long as the Secretary's conduct of the census is consistent with the constitutional language and the constitutional goal of equal representation, it is within the limits of the Constitution. And so therefore, the, adver the converse must also be true. If the Secretary's conduct of the census is inconsistent with the constitutional language and the constitutional goal of equal representation is outside the limits of the Constitution. So the question boils down, in, in, in my view, Your Honor, to the question of is it consistent with the language and the purpose of the enumeration clause? And the sole constitutional purpose of the enumeration clause is apportionment. So um, that's where I think the rubber, uh, the, the road, <laughs> The rubber meets the road, if I can use the right uh, aphorism. The rubber meets the road with respect to this issue. Because the, the argument is, well, if the citizenship question, including a citizenship question, um, is unconstitutional, then every uh, demographic question would also be un unconstitutional. And every census, the past 20 censuses, would be all unconstitutional. And that's simply not so. Because asking about age, for example, is not inconsistent with the constitutional purpose of the enumeration clause. Um, it's not inconsistent with the goal of conducting an accurate enumeration, as accurate an enumeration as possible, of all persons in each state. Um, however, asking about citizenship is when one considers the fact that, as the Census Bureau has for decades admitted, it will chill responses. Well, so in that respect, you do say uh, that uh, every census that is included in some form or another, the citizenship, citizenship question was constitutionally infirm. Not necessarily, and I, I believe my, my co-counsel addressed this. Uh, I think when you look at, so, so Wisconsin talks about the reasonable relationship, okay? And I think that is the, um, the manifestation or the articulation of determining whether something is consistent or inconsistent with the constitutional purpose of the enumeration clause. Um, and, and so I think if you, uh, if you go in a time machine to 150 years ago or 100 years ago, um, the world was much different then. This country was much different then. The country's demographics were much different then. Um, and while historical perspective does matter, and it is something that Judge Furman points out in his portion of uh, the order on the enumeration clause claim in the New York cases, um, I think historical context should also uh, be informed by, by more recent history. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, quite salient that the Census Bureau has for decades acknowledged this very fact, that adding a citizenship question and uh, on the short form questionnaire or, or requiring all respondents to disclose their citizenship status um, will uh, result in an undercount. Well, and under your theory, therefore, it was unconstitutional to do that. If, if, if we go in a time machine and in that context, if someone brought a lawsuit and said including the citizenship question on the census is unconstitutional, then you would, if you had the Wisconsin case decided then, of course, you would look and see if it was indeed inconsistent with the purposes of the enumeration clause. Here we think it clearly is, as the census for decades had realized. And that brings me to my next point, which is, um, well, actually, let me say one more thing about content versus manner, because I think this is important. Um, we do allege uh, that the Census Bureau failed to follow procedures that would typically be followed uh, in the event that a question as significant as a citizenship question were going to be added. Um, it's clear now from the administrative record that... Uh, That's an APA issue, though, isn't it? More well, it, it, well, it goes to the argument that the defendants are making here, which is that you have to draw a distinction between content versus manner. So my point is that, yes, it certainly goes to the APA issue, but if the... If the um, statement is that uh, we're not alleging that the manner in which the citizenship question has been implemented, um, then th that's not correct. We are, indeed, our, our complaint is rife with allegations to that effect, and it is something that we are going to explore in discovery and, and believe it's already borne 
uh, in spades by the administrative record. So I want to uh, direct my attention now just to a few standing arguments, and I want to start with the issue of speculation, because I think at its core, uh, that is what the defendants are arguing. They're arguing that the plaintiffs cannot meet their Article Three standing requirements because uh, it's too speculative to say that they've suffered an injury in fact, or that's, that, that injury is fairly traceable to the defendant's conduct. Um, first and foremost, I want to make sure we all understand the, the, the specific um, standard that applies here. So under the Susan B. Anthony case, uh, the substantial risk of future injury is sufficient to, to confer Article Three standing, no matter how trifling that injury might be. So there is language in that, uh, in that uh, case as well, Your Honor, that talks about whether or not the future injury is certainly impending. Uh, but it does talk about substantial risk as well, and I think that's important to consider here because our allegation in a nutshell is this is creating, uh, at, at a bare, bare minimum, a substantial risk, we think a very strong likelihood. Um, I also think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's interesting that, that um, defendants have taken the position that they have uh, because their, their position really does squarely contradict nearly four decades of, of their uh, uh, position uh, publicly. So um, in the uh, 1980 case against the uh, then uh, census director Four out of the District of Columbia. It, it, doesn't, it does have a, have a depressing effect? Yes, yes. It, in fact, the, the, the Census Bureau's official litigation position was that it was inevitable. That's the wording that was used. You look at, and, and I think Judge Furman refers to some of this information, you look at the um, amicus brief that was submitted in the Evenwell case by four former census directors. These are the people who were running the Bureau in both administrations. Um, they argued that it would, <clears throat> that adding a citizenship question on the short form census would, quote, invariably lead to a lower response rate to the census in general and seriously frustrate the Census Bureau's ability to conduct an actual enumeration. So um, this is not a novel concept. This is not a novel idea. It's one that the Census Bureau for years uh, and their directors, their leadership, have for years publicly articulated and adopted. Um, we think it's also, we, we, we allege in uh, paragraphs 82 and 83 of our complaint um, some, some information about uh, some studies that have been performed uh, regarding the, the, the general undercounting of uh, immigrant populations, which is the population that will disproportionately be affected if the citizenship question is allowed uh, to remain on the census. And uh, what I think is really interesting is that the Census Bureau's own scientific advisory panel, as we allege in paragraph 83 of our complaint, has sharply rebuked this decision. Um, so according to that panel, uh, Secretary Ross's decision is based on flawed logic uh, and is going to threaten the accuracy as well as the confidentiality of the 2020 census, among other issues. So um, the notion that it's speculative or that there's no, um, there's no evidence uh, of uh, this uh, undercount, we think is not a reasonable argument. Of course, evidence does not matter at this stage. Attention here is just whether or not you even get there under the enumeration clause. In other, in, you know, in other words, can we be in this world of doing this kind of assessment under the enumeration clause? And the government's position is that you, you never get there. Even, even acknowledging all that you've just said, the record would show, they'd say you don't, you, you don't get there by way of the enumeration clause. I think that's right, Your Honor, but I do believe that the defendants are moving uh, on all claims on the basis of Article Three standing. But well, that's and true. So, and so this I does also you were go focused on the enumeration clause, and you're really talking about the standing issue uh, now, and that's fine. I, and I and I do think it goes to sort of both both issues, but but really focused on standing for a moment. I think it it uh, uh, defeats any argument at this at this stage of the plea, uh, proceedings, uh, at any rate. Um, So uh, moving to just some of the standing allegations, I want to point out our, our complaint we think speaks for itself. Your Honor has already uh, indicated that um, you know, there are some detailed factual allegations in there about standing. Um, I think Your Honor understands our theory of the case. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that uh, in the San Jose case, the, the, the Baji organization is, um, is asserting standing as a uh, direct organizational standing on its own. 
uh, so that it itself has suffered injury because its mission has been thwarted and, and that it has to divert resources. Um, I, I don't believe that the defendants have really challenged that in any meaningful way. And the Havens case, the Supreme Court decision, clearly allows that sort of claim to proceed. And so we direct your attention, uh, Your Honor, to the case law that we've cited. I believe it's the Supreme Court carry decision, as well as some Ninth Circuit case law we've cited in our papers that says if one of the plaintiffs is able to establish Article Three standing at the pleading stage, the case moves forward. I will ask, uh, I meant to ask, and I will ask the government when they get back up on the BAJI organizational standing point. You're right. I would like to hear the re their response to that. Okay. Um, <coughs> just, uh, again, very, very quickly, um, I, I do draw the, cor uh, the court's attention to a couple of cases that I think are salient, particularly for my clients on the federal funding issue. Um, we cited the City of Detroit case. The City of Detroit case was a Sixth Circuit decision that we believe very clearly um, establishes that a, a, a party may bring a claim has Article Three standing to bring a claim and, and can articulate a cognizable injury in fact that's fairly traceable to the conduct of the Secretary of uh, Commerce and the Commerce Department if they claim that an undercount will result in loss of federal funding. And it's not reasonably disputable that as the 10th largest city in the country, the city of San Jose receives a lot of federal funding, which we've alleged for such things as transportation, infrastructure, and so on. And that those, those federal funding amounts may be decreased if ultimately there's an undercount of San Jose's population. Um, the, the Second Circuit's carry decision also uh, talks a lot about apportionment and, and standing, and I think it was obviously binding on Judge Furman being a Second Circuit decision, but it was something that he, uh, I think, found to be very persuasive, and, and we would argue, Your Honor, is, is highly persuasive authority uh, before this court. Um, Quickly, just on the 701A2 issue, on the uh, exception. So, so we cite some cases um, on page 28 of our brief, um, and 28 and 29 is the ASSE case and the Padula case. Um, and we think those are pretty straightforward. They, they, um, they, first of all, show that where you, even where you have statutory language, that grants an agency unfettered discretion, which is not necessarily the case here, um, that agency's decision may nonetheless be reviewed if regulations or agency practice provide a meaningful standard by which this court may, by which the court may review its exercise of discretion. And so the, the statement was made by defense counsel earlier that, well, yes, there are all these statutes and regulations that govern the manner in which the, the census must be conducted, but they're vague directives. Well, that's not, that, that's not our view, Your Honor. We actually think that the, the guidance and the guidelines that the Census Bureau has to follow and the manner in which the methodologies uh, that it has to follow and the manner in which it has to conduct the census are uh, concrete requirements, rules, practices, procedures. And uh, they do provide um, an, an articulable basis for the court to review those specific issues. Uh, and of course, coming back to Wisconsin again, to the extent that the argument under 701A2 is that there is no um, articulated uh, standard for judicial review, we think Wisconsin eviscerates that argument. Your Honor, uh, raise the question about the 14th Amendment claim. Um, the language of the uh, Section 2 of four, the 14th Amendment is very similar to the language in the enumeration clause. Um, we have filed claims for both. Um, I think much, if not all, of the same evidence ultimately that we develop uh, leading up to summary judgment and trial, uh, if we get to that point, will um, we'll be the same. But they are distinct claims. And um, I don't but actually see a, a different result with respect to the two claims. I mean, I, I am, I'm struggling a little to understand the, the and I'm not sure for today's purposes it's all that critical, but just when, if the day should come, uh, assessing the evidence uh, against those claims, I'm not really sure I'm seeing the fine distinctions. I mean, it's, I understand that uh, 14th Amendment talks about uh, apportionment and, and their different language than in the enumeration clause, but I'm, I'm wondering if they don't all rise and fall together. 
Well, I, I think the, the specific arguments that the defendants have raised on their motion to dismiss um, are directed, first of all, only to the enumeration clause claim, and I don't think that's by accident. They obviously know what our claims are, and they haven't moved for, they haven't moved on the Section 2 14th Amendment claim, um, and, and I don't want to speculate, but, but uh, my, my belief is that the reason why they have done that is because the 14th Amendment does specifically talk about apportionment, and that is specifically one of our, uh, the, one of the harms that we've alleged. Thank you, Your Honor. Government again, and I suppose my first question is: Your you, your motion to dismiss does not go to the uh, <coughs> um, apportionment claim under the Fourteenth Amendment. Your Honor, I apologize for any vagueness in the papers. We weren't meaning to not move to dismiss that claim. We just think that claim is fully encompassed in the enumeration clause claim. I, we, I, I really, I think, in fairness, I, I do read the government's motion as being a motion that's seeking a dismissal of your entire complaint. I don't think they, they took the position that they don't, they're, they are disputing whether or not uh, your apportionment claim can proceed. That's how I read your papers. That's correct, Your Honor. We don't think that the apportionment clause claim is a, a standalone claim separate from, the, we think that the enumeration clause claim arguments govern and that any claim they have under the Constitution, that those, that those are really one and the same. Right. Well, however I come out, I'm not going to find that you somehow waived the uh, a motion to dismiss with respect to that claim. I, I understood your arguments as, as you've just described. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just a, a couple of points. Um, first of all, plaintiffs uh, make much in their papers and then just now of statements in previous litigation. That's the Federation for American Immigration Reform case from 1980. Um, what plaintiffs are pointing to there is, first of all, statements of attorneys in litigation from 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago. So those statements can't bind the agency today. But more importantly, the climate issue in FAIR was one where an outside advocacy organization was seeking to force the Census Bureau to collect information on individuals' legal status. They wanted individuals who were here unlawfully to be excluded from the count. So they weren't seeking inclusion of a citizenship question per se, but a question going directly to whether or not someone was here unlawfully. That would be a very different question. Um, and so that would not affect our reviewability arguments. I'm just stating that the representations from the Census Bureau that were made in that litigation as to any potential harm that would come from plaintiff's argument, that that was a very different inquiry because of the specific information that the plaintiffs there sought. Um, second, Your Honor asked a question about intent. Um, while we would agree that if Your Honor reached the merits of the APA claim that intent would be relevant, the question of intent does not affect the inquiry under the enumeration clause, and it also doesn't affect the inquiry as far as reviewability. In other words, that's how I've understood your argument. Correct. Um, also, if I can grab one. I'd like to specifically, sorry, I'd like to specifically point your honor to just a couple of points in Judge Furman's case. Um, he specifically um, held, and I think it's telling that plaintiffs avoid coming out and, and expressing clearly their position on the constitutionality of the previous censuses that have collected citizenship information and other demographic information. I didn't hear them to hesitate. I think they're not, they're, they're not running away from the idea that, that those, inst those um, censuses may well have been unconstitutional. I think that's what I heard them say. They're just saying we're not litigating that direct question right now, but um, well, go ahead. I think that argument is, is frankly, kind of hard to swallow. Um, the Supreme Court has repeatedly emphasized the importance of historical practice. I think it's very difficult to argue that. But, but you know, not to harp on this, but um, to, to derive from that history what you want me to derive, wouldn't there need to have been a litigated case? I mean, the, the fact that certain things have occurred historically and they were not deemed to be unconstitutional is of consequence if, they were, if there was a contest. If there wasn't a contest, I, I, I'm not saying it's irrelevant. I think it's certainly something to take into account. Judge Furman certainly does when he's analyzing the enumeration clause. But I'm not sure how far it takes you. If, in the absence of, it certainly would take you very far if there was a, a precedent where 
I could look to it and they assessed it 40 years ago and determined that there was no constitutional problem with the citizenship question. Uh, if, in fact, if that had been the case, they probably might not even be a case here. But the absence of that, I'm, I'm not sure then how significant it is that there have been instances in history where the question has been asked. Respectfully, Your Honor, I would disagree. I don't think that- You're right. Tell me, tell, I'm, I'm interested. Go ahead. I don't believe that looking to historical practice that it's less persuasive simply because a particular question has not been litigated. Two reasons. One, the Supreme Court specifically looked to historical practice in its major census challenges. Uh, when it's reviewed whether or not statistical sampling, whether imputation, or whether in Wisconsin a statistical adjustment to correct for any differential undercount, whether those practices comported with historical practice, and they specifically stated that that was persuasive evidence of what the Constitution permits. Those questions hadn't been litigated before either, and the Supreme Court didn't find it any less persuasive. Secondly, we agree with Judge Furman, who says that um, he you know, canvasses the historical practice and then says that all three branches have long blessed and certainly tolerated the practice of asking sensitive demographic questions on the census. And he specifically says that taken to its logical conclusion, application of Wisconsin's reasonable relationship standard to every decision that concerned the census will lead to the conclusion that it's unconstitutional to ask any demographic question beyond the simple count on the census, because each of those questions bears no reasonable relationship. So there's never been a litigated case. There's something unique about this question from the plaintiffs are contending. This uniquely has the effect of, of affecting the enumeration, whereas the other demographic questions uh, may have other improprieties to them, but they don't have the, the impact that they're saying they can show this question has? Your Honor, I, I don't think that's the correct inquiry either. Um, I, but at least, I guess what I'm asking is if you, if you acknowledge that they're saying there is, it's not just questions versus not questions. It's they're saying this question is unique. They're not, they're not buying into your, your notion, I guess, that they have to defend the proposition, you know, um, questions are something that can be reviewed by a court if there are if they're questions that uh, may have some impact down the line. They're saying this question is, is unique. Isn't that how you understand their class? You can say you don't think it is, but that's what they're saying. They're not saying all, you can review any question. Courts can review any question. If it's a bad question and it may have bad consequences, you, the court, can review it. They're saying this particular question, because of its, its nature and its impact, is one you can review, even if you can't review other demographic questions. I do understand them to be distinguishing this question from others. That is correct. Um, I don't think that that... There's no, there's no basis to do that. I think there's no basis to do that and that that's not the proper inquiry under the enumeration clause. Um, the one other point that I would draw your Honor's attention to specifically from um, Judge Furman's opinion is he stated in a, uh, construing the enumeration clause that the clause calls for an actual enumeration and the census either satisfies that or standard or it does not. Um, and what the Congress and the Secretary intend is of no moment and specifically said that um, the political climate can't change the inquiry under the enumeration clause. Congress and the Secretary are either empowered to add this question to collect this information or they're not. And you know, the, I don't think you can you know, maintain the argument that every previous census has been unconstitutional through collection of this information. And there's simply nothing in the enumeration clause itself that would provide a standard to weigh each question there. Um, so we think plaintiffs are wrong to rely on the Wisconsin standard and we agree with Judge Furman that any question would be suspect under that standard. Um, as far as the APA argument, um, first of all, plaintiffs said that they want to conduct discovery to look into Census Bureau practices and policies. Uh, we would contend that plaintiffs can't uh, establish the standard that would apply for purposes of APA review through discovery. It's a jurisdictional limitation, Section 701A2. So plaintiffs need to provide at the outset their 
jurisdiction. They need to provide those standards that would apply. Um, contrary to what Council for California stated, we have not failed to address different purported sources of law to apply under the APA. Um, we've simply said that both the Census Bureau's past practices and things like the OMB directives, they're not judicially enforceable. These aren't standards under the APA inquiry that cabin the Secretary's discretion such that they provide law to apply, taking it out of the purview of Section 701A2. Um, as far as the um, standing point, um, what plaintiffs fail to distinguish is that the plaintiffs here aren't coercing people to cause the injury. What I mean by that is in particular, plaintiffs point to the Mendia case, the Ninth Circuit case. They claim that that's the standard and that it's satisfied here. In that case, there was a government action that was directly coercing third parties to cause the injury. Um, the, a government official had issued an immigration detainer that was allegedly wrongfully issued, and that prevented bail bondsmen from um, allowing the plaintiff to get out of jail for an extended period of time. So there, you don't have an independent choice of a third party. The issuance of an immigration detainer directly caused, directly coerced individuals to cause the injury. Um, that's not what's going on here. The government is, if anything, coercing people to respond. We're not coercing people to act in a way that would directly cause a loss of apportionment or funding. And so on the contrary, we think that the proper authority here is Nelson versus King County. It's a Ninth Circuit case from 1990, which states that both the Supreme Court and the circuit repeatedly have found a lack of standing <laughs> where a claim relies upon a chain of speculative contingencies, particularly a chain that includes the violation of an unchallenged law. That's what sets this case apart and particularly apart from other cases where a loss of apportionment or funding have been held sufficient to confer standing for purposes of a census inquiry. They did not rely on a claim that the government was acting in a way that would cause third parties to break the law. It's very different from what's here. Um, and then finally, we would um, reiterate that we think that the plaintiff's allegations that the Census Bureau's extensive non-response follow-up are not sufficient, and particularly they haven't shown any reason for this court to credit the idea that even if there's some small increase in initial self-responses, that that will, at the end of this chain of speculation, result directly in the losses the plaintiffs claim. State of California's view that uh, there may be distinctions between the different states in terms of uh, standing to bring the claims and, and the like, what, what is your view of that? Uh, do, you, do you agree that, there, that, that um, for purposes of analysis, uh, uh, the particular claims of a state as to the impact on that state may have some consequence on the standing analysis, and, or do you not think so? The argument we're putting forth doesn't depend on how close a particular state or locality is to losing a representative in the House or losing particular sources of funding. It's an argument that the chain they're relying on to establish their injury is itself insufficient, and so those allegations wouldn't really go to our argument there. Um, but in fact, the um, non-response follow-up argument that would apply equally. Um, another thing that plaintiffs have failed to take into account is not only just the extensiveness of that operation, but in particular the fact that it's a dynamic operation. So after Census Day, this is for any enumeration, but also for 2020, after Census Day there's a period where forms come back, and over the next few months these extensive non-response follow-up efforts take place. Um, in that the Census Bureau is constantly analyzing where the levels of, you know, undercount are taking place, where there has been a higher degree of responses, where it's been lower, and in fact they can mobilize those operations dynamically to address that. And what that means is that if there's a particular region where more... Is that though more of a merits argument down the line to say, uh, well, at the end of the day there's, there's no, this impact that uh, plaintiffs contend occurs doesn't occur. No, Your Honor, because for 12B1 purposes, it is permissible to rely on and to look to understanding. Yes, uh, to facts that are capable of judicial notice, and this is not something. Well, can that I this, take judicial notice of the impact of the follow-up? You I mean, can take. I, I, that's pretty tall order. What? What do I? What is the basis for my taking judicial notice of that? You can take judicial notice of the extensive. Um, statistical information that the Census Bureau makes public of what it has done in past censuses. That's carrying judicial notice, uh, expecting judicial notice to carry an awful lot of water. Judicial notice is uh, the device that I can use when there's complete, uh, there's no dispute that, you know, 
such and such occurred on such and such a date. The census takes place on such and such a date. I can take judicial notice of that, but the effect of your follow-up efforts to say I can judicially notice that is, uh, I think, stretching Rule 201, but okay. Well, let me clarify, Your Honor. I don't think so because, for instance, there's a particular report that I believe is cited in our papers, and I would be happy to file a supplemental if I am incorrect on this particular link being filed, but I believe that it is. There's a report that the Census Bureau puts out after each enumeration. It came out after the enumeration in 2010. And they report on the results of their post-enumeration survey. That post-enumeration survey is, in fact, what was at issue in the previous Supreme Court case. Um, so that survey is what found that although the initial self-response in 2010 was 63.5%, that actually after all the non-response follow-up, there was an overcount of a statistically insignificant 0.01%. I'm not sure it's critically clear, but I, I don't. I, I can certainly take judicial notice that a survey was done and the date the survey was done and those kind of facts. The content of the survey, I don't. To take judicial, you may have another reason. Other reasons why, if it's incorporated within the complaint in some fashion or another, I can certainly consider it for this purpose. Or, and you're right that a 12b1 is a bit more expansive than a 12b6, but I, I'm, I'm just telling you, I think your judicial notice notion may be a little broader than what I think it can be, but uh, okay. In particular, we're claiming that the failure to acknowledge and deal with the effect of this non-response follow-up is a deficiency in the complaint. I understand, but and it affects, you say, the ability that they have to show that they have standing to bring the claim on the injury in fact prong. Right? Yes, Your Honor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes? Briefly? Yes. No, I just need a few seconds, Your Honor. I just want to clarify one thing that I think is very important. Um, speaking earlier about whether the question would have been constitutional um, in the past, I think it's important to note that I said that if they had alleged everything that we had alleged, they would they would certainly pass the motion to dismiss stage so that we're not necessarily saying which i think possibly could be inferred um in judge Furman's opinion and by defendants counsel that it was in fact always unconstitutional we're not necessarily saying that we're saying given the facts on the ground right now it is unconstitutional because it will affect congressional apportionment and there's a difference between that and saying that the citizenship well, question. Under the, that, again, may, in my mind, have a distinction between your APA claim and your enumeration clause claim. Under the enumeration clause, I can't quite see how it could be constitutional before and not, not constitutional now. Under the APA, I can perhaps see how that argument can be advanced. And if I may answer that, the difference is by taking the act of adding the question, it will affect congressional apportionment. If it weren't going to affect congressional apportionment, then it would be okay. But the Wisconsin test says that you can't do things that are unreasonable with respect to the effect on congressional apportionment. And I think, again, that congressional apportionment element of the test is essential, and it's why our argument here is different than what was in New York. You have to look at the effect of the question. And that's why right now we have sufficiently alleged that there will be a violation. Thank you. Very briefly, Your Honor. Thank you. Two quick points. On the issue of coercive effect, um, the coercive effect of adding the citizenship question to the decennial census is at a minimum implied throughout our complaint um, and uh, arguably is directly alleged with our allegations of causation. At a minimum, we should be permitted to prove coercive effect at trial. Um, defense counsel cited the Nelson case as an example of uh, a case where it's, it's far too speculative and there's no coercive effect. The Nelson case, uh, if I recall correctly, involved, uh, it was a, a case filed by two plaintiffs who had been at a uh, treatment facility and they claimed that the, the treatment facility was unsanitary. And they sued to say, you have to change the treatment facility and make it more sanitary. And the court said, the Ninth Circuit said, no, that's not right because there's no indication that you're ever going to end up back in the treatment facility. And that case, I believe, stems from the city of Los Angeles versus Lyons line of, of cases, which had to do with the, the, the famous case about chokeholds. Um, this is a far different case. This is a case where 
we, we believe we'll be able to prove, Your Honor, that there is a direct coercive effect of asking a citizenship question of either an, an undocumented immigrant or a, a citizen who may live with undocumented immigrants or no undocumented immigrants or is just worried that somehow this information is going to be used to harm them. Um, that's a far different situation than the Nelson case or the Lyons uh, progeny. Uh, very quickly on the 14th Amendment issue. Uh, that, I understand the court's position and how the court read the papers. We did not read the papers as um, addressing the 14th Amendment claim, and I think there might be some basis to where we could try to distinguish that if given the opportunity. So all I would ask the court is to consider if the court is inclined to uh, grant the motion to dismiss the enumeration clause claim, uh, that we be given an opportunity briefly to provide some supplemental briefing about why we think the 14th Amendment claim might be different, particularly because um, you could draw a distinction between the enumeration clause claim on the theory that uh, all that requires, if the court were to find that, is that, that you have to do an actual enumeration, which is one of the arguments that they've made, that the defense has made, versus the 14th Amendment claim, which has to do directly with apportionment. Uh, with well, that, Your Honor. What beyond what you've just said would you need to, uh, what, what supplementing of what you've just told me you would need to do? Uh, I'm not sure there would be any, Your Honor, but I would, uh, but given that this was not part of the, the notice motion, um, we have not addressed it in our papers. If the court is inclined to grant the motion as to the 14th Amendment claim, um, we, we would at least um, appreciate the opportunity to provide some, some briefing on the issue. Um, and, I, okay. Thank you, Your Honor. It, was, it, was it your, it honestly was your view that the, that the government was going to take the position that they effectively would not contest your claim going forward past the motion to dismiss stage? Well, when we read the, the papers, we, we were surprised to see that it wasn't in there. Um, but if you, if you look at the, the way that they talk about it, it's directly going to the enumeration clause claim. Yes, I, my reaction to that, though, is they, they took the position that, they're, that um, they are effectively encompassed within their arguments and in terms of giving you more time to respond i mean I, I would have expected you to then say if you think there's this significant distinction that one would survive and the other might not that you would have already made that argument i i, I mean i were here and I, I would think you would have included that in your in your submission but okay understood your honor all right I'll, thank you I, okay so let's um, now uh, close out the discussion of the, of the motions and talk a bit, uh, not a prolonged discussion, um, about going forward. Um, I will go back. It's a very helpful argument, and I want to think through uh, some of what was presented to me today and review again what you submitted. So um, hopefully with dispatch, but not immediately will I have uh, the order for you. I want to give you, a, you're entitled to a thoughtful written order, and I will uh, do that. may not be quite as long as Judge Furman's, but it'll, it will be uh, hopefully thoughtful. Um, but for purposes of going forward, and I know there's, there are time issues with respect to this matter, um, it is my strong sense that in one form or another that I am going to find that the case can proceed. Um, and with that understanding, I think we should talk about uh, discovery and then also case planning. Um, I did review, as I said, this, the joint statement that was provided in each of the cases, and I very much appreciate it and, uh, and I'm heartened that in a, um, it appears the parties are, are where they can working together, and I encourage that, and I think that's a good thing. Um, the, the discovery order that Judge Furman issued in his case, I think, is a good jumping off point for our proceedings here. I think he set some parameters that made sense to me, and I, I think that can be our operating principle. I know we have Maryland cases as well. Where, where are the Maryland cases in terms of their uh, process? 
Uh, Judge Hazel held argument on whether discovery should proceed at the same time as the motion to dismiss, but did not yet authorize separate discovery. Okay. So we've entered into a stipulation with each set of plaintiff's counsel that permits them all to participate in the dep depositions notice to New York. And Judge Furman invited counsel to file limited notices for the appearance of participating in those depositions, so including Marilyn, they are. And our understanding, uh, plaintiff's counsel could speak to better, but we've been specifically advised by New York counsel that plaintiffs in the California California and Maryland cases have kind of funneled some of their document requests and 30B6 deposition topics through New York Plaintiffs Council. So I believe they are coordinating in that. But we are right now responding to document requests and deposition notices noticed by the New York Council. Okay. Um, that's, all, that's, that's all very encouraging, but I'm not so naive as to suspect that there is there will never be any disputes we'll have some discovery disputes and i think at that stage uh what i'm not in, again entirely clear on is just the decision process of adjudicating any of those disputes because we do have three separate courts and in three separate circuits and you know so we'll kind of have to see what happens but in terms of giving you some guidance again assuming this matter goes forward and i and i'm fairly confident it will in one form or another. If I adopted Judge Furman's discovery uh, parameters, uh, is that workable? Will that work for our case now? In both of one, one all three of you can come up. Uh, for, the, for the California plaintiffs, that would be acceptable. However, we would just, um, point out that we are working together and trying to coordinate with the other plaintiffs to streamline everything. But we also, um, and, and while we have some input on the discovery that the other cases serve, we also don't have control over it. So that to the extent we feel like we need to take depositions or um, request documents that, that are not part of any kind of New York or joint request, we also would reserve the right to do that if well, we cannot the, coordinate. Uh, what that implicates for me is there, there were some, there are limits that Judge Furman put on in terms of just, you know, the mechanics, numbers of depositions and the like. Um, how best can, uh, that's not limiting in the sense that it's saying the content of your discovery requests. It's just saying you can't have more than X depositions and this, that, and the other thing. So if, if I adopted that, is that workable for, I understand you have some specific questions that may be different than the New York questions or the Maryland questions, right. I understand with respect, that. Yeah, with respect to depositions, I think, I think the idea was he was giving those 10 depositions um, and it wasn't necessarily a hard limit for the whole case, um, but that was certainly to start with. And so certainly to start with, we're happy, you know, we're working together um, to um, schedule those 10. Um, but again, at some point, um, there could be diversions, divergence on well, other witnesses, and, and we don't anticipate that. Let me ask you this, is from e each of you, um, again, with the government reserving their right to maintain the position that I should dismiss the case, but, and that's, I, anything you say now I will not interpret as somehow uh, contrary to your position. If I, what should, from each of your perspective, what should I do? Should I enter an order now that mirrors Judge uh, uh, Furman's order? Should I simply say, follow Judge Furman's order? Or should I enter a different order? Or what should I do? So let's start with, with uh, what the government's view is on that. I think there are a couple of important things to note. For one thing, um, Judge Furman's order did grant document discovery, among other things. And the plaintiffs in the New York cases have served upon defendants extremely broad document requests. I have these here. Um, they call for wide-ranging document production within both the Commerce Department and the Census Bureau. They've also issued a Rule 45 subpoena to the Department of Justice. And so my um, counsel is back in DC, um, did not travel here with me today. They are. Um, working very, very hard to respond to these very wide-ranging document requests that are calling for the collection and processing of an unknown number, but a very, very large number of documents. And so the, to the extent that in their papers, um, California and, um, and San Jose plaintiffs argued that we should also respond to their document requests, which very significantly overlap, and that we should do so within seven days, I think Your Honor should deny those. I think that um, 
defendant should respond to the document requests we have already received from New York. Um, we think this requires the production of uh, everything that is relevant in this case and, and beyond that. Um, and we think that to the extent that after that production is complete, there are any particular categories of documents, if plaintiffs come up with any additional categories that have not been produced, that that should be visited then. But we don't believe we should be responding to overlapping and very burdensome document requests in different Can't you, can't you start with the New York, uh, what, uh, what the New Yorkers are going to be receiving is uh, at the very least going to be amongst the materials you want. You may want more, but why don't we start with that so we can do this in some orderly process? Not to preclude you from seeking some additional discovery if you can demonstrate that it's appropriate, but I want, I just want what I think is also in, in your interest as well, uh, there's going to be a certain basic amount of material that you're going to want and that the government is going to be prepared to provide. And, and you don't want the whole thing to bog down in a dispute at the beginning, which then means even that basic interchange of material doesn't go forward. I want to get the, the stuff that plainly is going to be exchanged, exchanged. And then we can fight about other things um, when we get there. But I actually think it's in particular in your interest not to have the whole whole nine yards litigated right now, because then that's probably going to put a stop to anything. So we would agree with that generally, Your Honor, and, and we have entered into uh, an understanding with uh, the defendants that uh, anything that's produced in the New York case, they will produce to us. So conceptually, what you just articulated, we are generally fine with. I will point out that, uh, at least with respect to my clients, um, our document requests have been pending for several months now, and if Your Honor may recall at the uh, June 28th motion hearing, we talked about the importance of uh, getting those documents uh, soon after uh, any ruling from the court granting right, discovery. And I pointed out, which you, you reminded me that I pointed out, that the, the effect of that is that the, uh, I think the government can't take the position that uh, this is the first they ever heard that you want this stuff. Right. So, so what I would suggest is this. Uh, what you have articulated makes sense for sort of step one. Whatever they produce in the New York case cases, um, they will provide to us. We will expeditiously look through and, and find and uh, determine if um, there are document requests that we have propounded as to which those documents do not. Are they concerned respond. about apparently the some seven day period for your overarching requests? And are you willing to now do it in the fashion you've just described, get the New York stuff and then, uh, and, and perhaps you'll have a basis for saying it's got to be accelerated once you've a analyzed New York stuff. I know we're under time constraints, so I'm not precluding you from saying the, the, uh, you know, the usual time parameters, maybe they need to be shortened once you've looked at the New York material, and if I conclude that you are indeed entitled to more. Um, but that seven-day provision, I'm not sure I'm entirely understanding that, but is the, Ms. Bailey seems to think that according to your requests right now, is this San Jose requests, uh, California, or both? Okay. Are calling for some sort of response separate and apart from the New York response, seven days from today, from today? That is what they filed a request for this week, Your Honor. Okay, so what's your position on that? So, so this is what I would propose, Your Honor. Um, I, I think we, we need to, to proceed forward with reasonable expediency. Um, the government has had our document requests and California's document requests for uh, a, a significant amount of time. If there are specific requests as to which defendants are refusing to produce documents, then I think it's reasonable to request that that information be supplied to us forthwith within seven days. And then we can meet and confer well, and talk York, about that. What's the New York timetable? Your Honor, if I'm understanding plaintiff's counsel correct, I think what was just articulated was very different from what I think we were just discussing. Um, let me clarify. What I thought we were discussing was that defendants would respond to the New York discovery requests. And to be frank, Your Honor, it would be hard for me to overemphasize how burdened some of these responses are. And it, what's the current date that you are targeting to respond in New York? Our responses and objections and our document, our responses and objections are due on this Monday, the 13th. 
Uh, we anticipate beginning the production then and making a rolling production as expeditiously as possible. <coughs> this is calling for the collection of a giant amount of documents. And as I'm sure and, you're and, aware. And you've done a good job of making it clear to me that you think this is a, a massive undertaking. And I'll, I'll accept that. So May I okay. add also, uh, Your Honor may very well be aware, but Judge Furman's order also required us to supplement the administrative record. That's separate from the document request. We've already produced somewhere around 11,000 pages of documents from that. So the, the core documents that would be most relevant to plaintiff's case are already out there. And so this is other material. I understand. Um, and so our position is that we should make this production we don't believe that there that there will be anything left on the table that would comply with the rules regarding relevance and burden so that could still going be going back to my question before monday is the beginning of the of the production and it may be on a rolling basis and i understand that and you're also going to give a response to to new york in terms of objections you may have now with respect to the the pending request for california in San Jose, I would think that you can do two things. You can share with them, obviously, what you're doing with New York. And I, and I also think you should be, because you, you do know what they've wanted for a long time, you should be in a position to state whatever objections you're going to state or respond to the request, putting aside actually producing any documents beyond the New York production. Can't you do those two things in a fairly expeditious fashion? I think that the landscape has dramatically changed from when plaintiffs provided us those document requests. Those document requests were given to us. Um, and part of your answer, though, in terms of your response to them, I assume perhaps the preamble will be exactly what you just said. What I'm saying is, you know, when you get a document request, two things are triggered. One is, are you going to produce documents, or and then are you also going to state your objections and and um, make clear what you will and will not do. That's more of, as we all know, that's more of the legal response that the lawyers put together. And what I'm saying is that aspect of responding to what California and San Jose uh, and BAJI have done, that should be done in a shorter period of time. I think that's that- That's separate and apart from producing materials. I think that because, I'm sorry if I wasn't very clear, but what I meant by the landscape has changed is I think it would be a very large waste of effort and wouldn't serve the interests of any, any party for us to go through and make specific objections and responses to document requests that were issued before we entered discovery in New York and have done all of this. In other words, the document requests that were issued by California and San Jose very much overlap with what we're doing in New York. I don't think we should have to file objections and responses to document requests when we're already making very similar productions in New York. I think that as I thought plaintiff's counsel was agreeing to a moment ago, although I could have misunderstood. I think they should review the objections and responses we issue in New York, and then at least begin to review the documents that we issue in our rolling production beginning on Monday, and then assess to what extent their requests go above and beyond what was required in New York, and then we'll deal with those separately. I don't think we should have to respond to these document requests that are already superseded by New York. Well, I, I, would, I would object to the notion that New York uh, plaintiffs have superseded our, our document request. I don't know if I've gotten everything that I've asked for unless I receive some formal objections from the other side saying, yes, we have produced, yes, we will produce, or no, we will not produce for these reasons. That's why the federal rules of civil procedure require the service of objections. Uh, all we're asking for is to understand, and, and I don't think it's all, all that burdensome to request written responses when they've had our request for three I, I think that you, I, I think that the, the general notion of, respond, of producing pursuant to the New York request and not, ex, not requiring any production specific to the California and San Jose requests makes sense. At the same time, I don't think it's that burdensome to, uh, yeah, we, we uh, respond to discovery requests in terms of just the position of the party requested to produce the documents all the time. And that's, I frankly don't think that that is so burdensome because it's a, it's a written response to the, to what they, and if the response is events have, have overtaken your request, we don't think we have to give this uh, to you. And uh, we think all responsive materials that are properly produced are in the New York production, so be it. 
you, and we'll litigate those questions if we have to, but I don't think it's too much to ask you to respond in a pleading to what the, the parties have asked for. I do think, however, that I don't look in the immediate future for you to have to produce actual materials beyond what you have to produce for New York. So uh, is it correct that your, your Honor is saying that we have to go through and specifically respond to all of the document requests, even to the extent they overlap? So what I was you have to respond in the sense that you have to say what your position is. That's not so burdensome. You say, if your position is, well, things have changed for, if, if this is no longer, um, or, or, I mean, I don't even think things have changed really is all that relevant. All the, they're entitled to know what you, what your, legal position is. Are you saying we don't have to produce this or are you saying or are you saying it's already been we've given it to you because it's in the New York what you're asking for is entirely contained within the New York production or okay we're not producing it to you today but we're not objecting to producing this material. You're asking for your position is not burdensome to me and I think you can do that um, unless you can tell me why that's somehow out of the norm. Um, you, you, you have to analyze, it, it, you're saying, oh, well, that's effectively what I'm hearing you say, is California and San Jose have made way over broad requests and to the extent that there's anything really that is legitimately producible, it's pretty much already going to have been produced in New York. Um, that's fine if that's your position. They just are entitled to know that so that they know how they move forward. Well, our position is that this is uh, a somewhat unique situation and that we have these six challenges spread out across the country. And I, I, I'm not going to, you know, go back through it, but as I said, it's a massive undertaking no, for no, us to respond to these. I'm, I'm not, I, maybe I'm not understanding you. I, I'm assuming, I haven't looked at it, that San Jose and, and, and San Francisco, I mean, San Jose and California, have, have each, in their cases, given you a, uh, a request to to produce documents or something, and it's, I, I've seen bazillion of them in my short life, and they are probably like this thick or so, and they have all sorts of requests to produce. And if that's what they've given you, I don't, I guess I'm not understanding why it would be so difficult for you to state your position. Okay, they ask for every document the Secretary of Commerce has, has authored in such and such a time period, and then below that you say, we object to this because it's privileged or it's, you know, it's beyond the scope or blah, 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 blah. Why, why can't you do that? Even in a massive case, that's, I mean, it takes some time to formulate your position. I understand that, but I also don't think it's, you know, horribly burdensome. It's what we do all the time. Well, I understand that Your Honor may disagree. It's just uh, to clarify, our position was that our legal position will be set forth in the objections and responses that we're producing on Monday, in the well, very next I, business day. I think day. in fairness to California and San Jose, in this case, they're, they're entitled to get your answer to their requests in this case. They, don't, they shouldn't have to guess whether or not uh, your response to New York is fully applicable to their request for documents in whatever category. What I am willing to do for you, which is a, a big thing, is say that you, you don't have to produce at the moment documents responsive. We'll take your New York production and see where that falls. And it may well be that your answers in part are going to be um, New York answers your questions. Go look at those documents. And then they can tell me we don't think that that's so, and then I've got a bunch of motions I have to decide. But that's how I think you should proceed. So the pending requests that, that, that California has and that San Jose has calls for a written response by when? Well, Your Honor, we, we propounded, uh, San Jose propounded the request, I think, in May, and I believe that California did uh, theirs in June. Right. Uh, so, so what we would ask for is seven days from today's date, uh, particularly if they're already going to be doing objections, formal objections by Monday in the New York cases. Uh, I don't think that will be uh, all that burdensome. And for the record, we have not propounded a bazillion document request in this case. It's, it's a manageable amount, particularly given the stakes of the, of the case. Two weeks. You've got two weeks to give the written response to their pending discovery requests. So 14 days, you have to give, us, give them a written response. And that's also on, the, on your representation and understanding that 
You're going to be starting some rolling New York production on Monday and a response to New York, and they are going to have access to that material. And then once I have your responses, or they've had those responses, they look at them, they see your New York position, production, they can then, it, the ball will be in their court after you have then responded to indicate if they think they're entitled to further discovery and why, and we'll go from there. Um, now, let's talk about the, the, the end, of the, end of the road, at least for me. Uh, it will not be the end of the road <coughs> for you. Um, when we're going to have further proceedings in this matter, I, was, uh, I, I recall in the end of July when we got together, there was some discussion about December, and I had said, well, I don't know about that, but I went back and looked, and I could probably have proceedings in December. But now I looked at your latest submission, you said January 7th. So let me start with what the plaintiffs want. First of all, you, we're not sure whether or not this could be resolved on some sort of cross-motion basis, and you were unclear on that at the time. But then, assuming it was going to be a trial proceeding, it's a bench trial in front of me, correct? Correct. Okay. And, we were, and you were also, and nobody was quite clear on how long that would take. So what is, let's start with the plaintiff side. What is your current, and I know you, you need to get an answer from me in terms of claims going forward. I'm not sure how long it would take and what you would present are going to be all that impacted by the particular claims that can go forward or not, but maybe it will. So give me your sense of this. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Caucus. If you two want to caucus, you can go ahead too. Your Honor, so, so well, we have uh, plaintiff's counsel have conferred, and, and uh, we will gladly accept a December trial date. Uh, if the court would prefer, um, we're also fine with January 7th, uh, but we wouldn't want any date after that date. Bailey. We think that this case can be resolved on summary judgment. We think that this case will, uh, will not require trial um, and that it could be cross motions for summary judgment. We also think that the claims, um, of course, we're not sure exactly what will survive, um, but that the claims very largely overlap. And um, this is, while it's a somewhat unusual case, it's not entirely novel that we have you know, separate cases challenging the same agency decision. And we think that in the future, the plaintiffs should coordinate on briefing rather than having to respond to two separate briefs that largely or entirely overlap with one another, particularly when discovery disputes, but also as far as summary judgment, we think there is historical practice of that taking place, including in other analogous cases in this district. Um, and we think that would be a more efficient way to move forward. So we would um, argue that this case could be resolved on cross motions for summary judgment later this year. Well, just from a mechanics point of view, maybe what I need to do is um, identify a motion date and then also a uh, if their trial proceedings are required a trial date. The problem is if there is a motion date proceeding, at least say a December trial, we're really, it's really crunching up time-wise. Um, when will you, do, are plaintiffs sure yet what their position will be on whether or not it can be, uh, there could be a, a motion resolution of this as opposed to a full trial proceeding. Do you know when you'll know that? Well, on behalf of uh, the City of San Jose and, and Black Alliance for Just Immigration, Your Honor, um, I can tell you that we believe that uh, it is indeed resolvable on summary judgment in our favor, and we are planning at this juncture on filing a motion for summary judgment on uh, all or, some or all of our claims. 
um, depending on, on how we decide to move forward. Uh, I do think that it's, it's certainly not uncommon uh, in complex litigation to have uh, both sides believing that their cases can be uh, resolved on, on dispositive motions, and, and uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we shouldn't get a trial date. Um, and so I think we would ask for that today. It will give us clarity and um, some, some concrete dates to work with and know exactly what we have uh, at stake. And, and so um, I understand Your Honor's uh, concern about, expressed concern about the, the dispositive motion hearing deadline and its proximity to trial. Um, I think uh, that's just the nature of this particular case, given the expediency of the, the resolution uh, that, that's required. But um, I think that's a workable uh, schedule in this case. Uh, even with a December trial date, I think that gives us enough time to conduct the discovery we need, as Your Honor will permit us to do to the extent that Your Honor does so. Don't you think a, a better approach, perhaps as I'm thinking about it, would be to take the January date for trial and the motion date to be in early December? Oh, we could do it that way again, uh, Your Honor. When, when we picked the January 7th date, we were informed by Your Honor's prior comments that, that December might not work. Um, I think the, the, uh, the dates that the San Jose plaintiffs had contemplated for, for dispositive motion hearings was November 15th. Um, I believe that it's November 29th that the California plaintiffs have, have requested. And that's the deadline, of course. That's not the date. That's necessary. the hearing date. That's the hearing deadline, but not necessarily the date on which all hearings must occur. Um, if we file sooner than that, then we might want to have it heard sooner than that. So that's the cutoff date as proposed. Uh, but I think even with a um, November 29th cutoff date, if we could get a December trial date, um, we can make that work. Uh, because we're going to have to make it work in this case. California's view? Our view is essentially the same. We also think it should be able to be resolved on summary judgment, but we also want a trial date that's, that's as soon as December, just in case we need to go there. Um, I believe also Judge Furman contemplated something, um, a procedure in which there was, it was potentially a combined summary judgment trial, briefing some issues and then a trial. And so I just wanted to raise that possibility here as well. Summary judgment plus. I'm not sure what that, what form that would take. Um, I mean, that, that then one option would be, I suppose, to set a date that covers both and as we get closer we determine whether or not it's a motion argument or if it's got an evidentiary component to it or not um, but not have two separate dates I mean that's also a possibility in New York they do have a status conference set for September and I I believe that they are going to attempt to get more clarity on that at that status conference so that would be an option for us as well but you know I think I think we would also be fine with following our either our proposed schedule or having that trial date in December if I may you're on if well, I mean let me hear from Miss Bailey saying that go ahead. Uh, well we fully agree about um, summary judgment um, potentially being able to resolve the case. Um, we think that the November 29th is likely to be too soon, and we would um, urge the court to set a date in December. Um, the reason for that, um, with the schedule that Judge Furman has set, we're already running into disputes that we think um, we, we shouldn't be running into because um, Judge Furman set a date for expert reports that's so soon that plaintiffs in New York are pressing to have a 30B6 um, very, very quickly so that they can have that information for their expert reports. And the problem is that we are physically unable to produce all the documents that we need to produce in order to be prepared for that 30B6. And so we're very crunched there. And we've asked New York plaintiffs to join in a request. It, this hasn't been made, but we've asked them to join in a request to push back the expert deadlines so we have a little more time to produce documents and reasonably prepare our witness and that we think it would advantage both sides. I'll tell you. And plaintiffs are unwilling to do that. I think the best thing for me to do is to set a, um, a hearing date, a dispositive motion hearing date, and do it in early December. And then set, leave January 7th, which is, I know you'd like the, a full trial if one is necessary before that, but that's the fail safe, uh, that that would be a, if we have, a, have an ev evidentiary proceeding, we would have it on the 7th. I had a trial set and I, told the litigants yesterday that uh, about this prospect and so they're a bit 
depressed seeing that that is now January 7th is the result of several bumps to get there. Um, and I do have some criminal speedy trial issues as well on some cases. But all that said, I think the best way to do it is early, early December for motion practice. And that would mean that if, if both sides think we can accomplish it through motion practice, that date actually isn't kind of a tentative one. That should be workable for that. And then if we have to go to a trial proceeding, everybody can live with the January 7th. Wouldn't make your holidays very pleasant, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so let's go with that. So Ms. Liu, in the first week in December, can we have a, and I'll specially set it, and um, maybe a Wednesday or a Friday, Okay. You have a preference? We have a preference for a Friday, if possible. Okay. How about December 7th? Works for us, Your Honor. Okay. So that day will be the day for motion practice. That's the, the uh, dispositive motion hearing cutoff date. And then January 7th will be a bench trial date, and we'll see if we need it or not. And then... Um, uh, the rest of where we are, just to reiterate, is uh, I am adopting Judge Furman's discovery parameter order. Um, I am uh, taking the government's representation that the production they're going to start to make and the response they're going to make on Monday the 13th will be shared and uh, can be utilized and any discovery that is resulting from that process will be utilized in our case. Um, and then uh, when that is, uh, and then in two weeks, the government will respond, provide a written response to the plaintiffs in our two cases as to their position with respect to the discovery request. And while that is all going on, I will be diligently attempting to get you an order in these two cases on the government's uh, motions to dismiss. Did I leave anything out? Your Honor, um, we also would like to get dates on a few of the other items that were in our joint report, such as expert deadlines. And it, what we'd like to do is maybe, since the motion deadline's been moved back about a week, if we could just kind of move each of those dates back about a week, that would seem to make sense. Ms. Bailey? We would be fine with that. Okay. Um, I've got your joint proposed, well, it's not a joint proposed schedule. It's plaintiff's proposed schedule, and then defendant's schedule is kind of teed off of um, moving on these dates, depending upon my order. Um, I would think if you're comfortable with now that I've modified uh, your response, the two-week period, moving everything back. Um, you, so does that mean all of your dates? But now asking the plaintiffs, all of the dates other than trial date, obviously, would move um, back, what, two weeks or one week? I think just one week. I think but the initial disclosures, both expert deadlines and the close of discovery, the idea would be if we could push each of them back one week, because that would be the same t amount of time period. want to see this? Really? I'm so sorry. I don't have a copy of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> So for those four, if we move back a week. Yes, that would be fine, Your okay. Honor. Sorry That's what we'll do. I will adopt that schedule um, so that I don't uh, lose track of it. Could you give me a new proposed uh, schedule that incorporates, I'll, I'll ask the plaintiffs to be take the laboring ore and preparing it, send it to Ms. Bailey, and then hopefully you can submit it to me as our uh, plan of operation. One brief point of clarification, and first of all, thank you to Your Honor and your staff for letting us, for indulging us the lunch hour. We appreciate it. Um, your Honor asked earlier about the, the discovery process, and, and I understand the, the, the order that the court is going to issue. Um, two quick things. The, the parties have actually agreed to discovery coordination procedures in all six cases, including the two before Your Honor, and that, that, that discovery coordination order uh, recognizes that the plaintiffs in these two cases before your, before your Honor are not waiving their independent right to take depositions of witnesses whom the New York plaintiffs will not call. 
And so it contemplates we will cross notice those depositions that we do want to participate in, but we're not obligated to, and we're certainly not limited to the 10 that they pick. Not limited in the sense that you can make the argument as to why you should have more. Well, certainly we would reserve the right to do that if it came yes. up, but we're not, what I meant to say, Your Honor, is that um, as, as agreed, uh, and, and based on the, the reservations that we put into the discovery coordination order, um, we're not obligated to depose the same individuals that the New York plaintiffs are. If there's uh, some deposition that we don't think we need in our case, uh, or there's a deposition that we think we do that the New York plaintiffs don't, we're not foreclosed from taking that deposition. Fine. I wanted to clarify that. We would like to, I'm sorry. If, if possible, clarify that, that we believe that the same individual should not be called more than once. I don't understand plaintiffs to be saying that. But we also believe that any potential deposition of Secretary Ross should be separately briefed, as Judge Furman stated. That, that um, Judge, Judge Furman said that plaintiffs would have to take some depositions and then brief a showing. I, as I say, I, I read Judge Furman's uh, order, and I found it to be a very good um, plan of action. And so I'm adopting that, including the the parameters with respect to any deposition ultimately of the secretary. One final point, if I could. Um, Judge Furman said something at the July 3rd hearing that I don't remember the exact words of, but he said that he wanted to work out and, and wanted thoughts on some kind of proposal such that um, if either side got a, an answer they didn't like on a particular discovery dispute that they didn't run from mommy to daddy is the way he phrased it. That, that's as I've expressed all along, and I've said to Judge Furman, I mean, he and I, I, you and had no problem with my talking to him, and I took you at your invitation, and I've spoken to him, and I know him. So, um, you know, I've expressed to him, and he, he, I guess, reflected it in the comments he made. That that is the still the uncertainty I have because I uh, suspect there will be some disputes, and the effect of one district judge's ruling on that on a particular dispute is I'm trying to work out how that happens. I mean, in a perfect world, uh, you know, litigating the same discovery dispute three times is not a very efficient way to go. But we do have the, the reality that we are, we are district judges in, within different circuits that have different rules sometimes, even on things like, you know, the scope of discovery. I'm not, I can't summon uh, an example. but. You know, it's almost an MDL type of, of concept, but we don't have a mechanism that I'm aware of to exactly implement that kind of idea. But so what he he agrees that we was his example. Don't go from mommy to daddy or whatever. Did not, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's one way to phrase it. Uh, uh, you know, I I share his I share that concern, but and I don't have an obvious answer to how we do it. I mean. In practice, one it, it, when we're down to the granular level of discovery issues, one when the the first of us I don't know quite candidly I don't know the judge in Maryland, but one when one of us deals with it, it's going to have fairly persuasive authority on the other two I suspect, but how we actually go about it does someone is there does anyone have any ideas how we do this? Yeah, I think we've, we've tried to address that, at least in part, in the discovery coordination procedures. What we've agreed to is that if there is an issue that arises during a deposition that was noticed by the New York plaintiffs, um, that those issues are going to go exclusively to Judge Furman in New York. Uh, the parties are, are in the process of filing notices of appearance in that case, which is what he's authorized in his, in his most recent order. Um, and then if there are any other issues that arise, for example, the document requests in this case, those co would come to you in this matter. They would go to Judge Hazel if the Maryland uh, litigants had, had a dispute and so on. Well, so that means to give it a specific example, and we're almost done, um, let's say there is a deponent. In, it's been noticed in New York uh, by the New York, uh, in the New York case by the New York participants, and they notice a deposition and a dispute arises in the deposition about this proper scope of questioning or what have you. And that issue is then presented to Judge Furman and Judge Furman rules. Uh, is, what's your position on the impact of that ruling in this case? If the, the parties, my understanding is that, that both sides, you know, the, the plaintiffs in both cases have agreed that they will be bound by that All right, ruling. okay, well that, that that's good. But for that very specific 
uh, those okay. very specific parameters, something that arises in a deposition noticed by the New York plaintiff. And this is all memorialized in what place? I believe we attach it to our joint report, Your Honor. It's a discovery coordination order that judge that, that the New York plaintiffs, uh, in conjunction with the uh, DOJ, submitted to Judge Furman, in which he adopted as Adopted, his yes. Okay. And you're comfortable with that protocol? You're comfortable with that protocol. I would ask, um, I, I apologize that I have not discussed this with plaintiffs, but if there are discovery disputes that are specific to this case that they bring before you, we would ask that they file one brief on that discovery dispute rather than filing two briefs that we have to respond to on every dispute. Well, we, will, gla we will gladly meet and confer. It's the first time that, that uh, defense counsel has raised this, so we'll gladly meet and confer. We want to be as reasonable as possible. Certainly don't want to duplicate efforts and, and force them to right. have to do Particularly this. Particularly in discovery. I don't want to get uh, two separate briefs on the plaintiff's side reiterating the same. I, I, I agree with the, with the goal of there's a discovery dispute. I want to hear from both groups, uh, but not independent briefs. Um, in terms of limiting it when we get to, say, cross motions for summary judgment, we'll deal with that as we get closer to it. I'm wondering whether or not I should also set a, a status conference date. Um, but I don't think I'll do it now. I may, as we proceed along, if I think <coughs> I need uh, to have a uh, session with you, I won't be shy about doing that. Did you want to? Uh, we have a motion to intervene also on calendar today. Uh, represent Los Angeles Unified School District. I'm Sue Ann Evans. I just wanted to put it on the radar. Okay. I will uh, review the motion. I, uh, it's unopposed. Well, if it's unopposed, it carries with it a pretty good <laughs> prospect it's going to be approved. But I'll make sure to address it. Thank you. Take a look at it. Okay. Anything further? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.